you expecting Rick Munkin? I haven't heard either way. So I usually assume that's a yes, um, but I haven't heard either way. You guys want to wait a minute or two for Robin, or do we want to call it and she'll join us when we get through, uh, when she gets to us? Um, I'd like to make sure we get through all of our stuff tonight, so we probably should start. And we have, um, I just looked and saw that there are 25 people in the waiting room, so we got folks waiting for us. Busy agenda tonight. Tonight. All right. All right. I'm going to call this meeting to order. Uh, welcome everyone to the October 26, 2020 Town of Scarborough Planning Board meeting. Thank you all for attending this evening. Uh, the first call uh, after the call of order is the Pledge of Allegiance. Uh, Jay, if you could assist. All right. Please join me in rising for the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for the stand. One Dance, nation. one nation, under God, indivisible, indivisible. liberty, liberty and justice, justice for all. For all. all right. And as this is the roll call, um, I will perform the roll call. Do uh, Rachel Hendrickson. Here. Roger Beely. Here. Jennifer Ladd. Here. Robin Saunders. Rick Duperry. Rick Mike. Here. Here. All right. I show uh, Robin is currently not joining us. So as first alternate, Rick Duperry, you will be a voting member until she is able to join. All right. Our uh, next item is the approval of the October 5th, 2020 minutes. They are currently not ready. So I will uh, make a motion to table those minutes. Do I have a second? Second. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Rachel Henderson? Jennifer yes. Ladd? Robert, Roger Bealey? Yes. Rick DuPerry? Yes. Nick McGee? Yes. Thank you. All right. And we're going to do our customary uh, disclosure warning here for Zoom meetings. Uh, this is a remote meeting using Zoom. People can access this meeting by going to the planning board's webpage and for viewing only, click on the YouTube link to attend the planning board meeting virtually to provide public comment at the meeting click the zoom link the board recommends written public comment prior to an upcoming meeting at this time given the remote nature of this format directions can be found on the planning board's web page attendees are muted and must raise a hand to be calling the comment parts of the agenda please only raise your hand once it's time for public comment not during the applicant's presentation board deliberation etc if the chair happens to drop off the meeting due to technical difficulties the vice chair will start running the meeting all right. Uh, more housekeeping is uh, we are we are clearly uh, with a packed agenda over 16 items for business on the business side of things. Uh, so we're going to ask all of our applicants to uh, try to limit their presentations more than uh, 10 minutes. Uh, discussion on the board and by the applicant should be limited to just the main elements that were notated in staff comments. Uh, anything that's not a waiver or a main element. Uh, uh, those items, uh, we're going to assume that staff's comments are being uh, considered by the applicant and will be uh, implemented or resolved with staff at that time. Unless, of course, there's an item that the applicant needs to call to our attention, they do not believe they can comply with. Um, with that said, uh, first item tonight is Crossroad Holdings LLC requests a amendment to the conditions of approval for the Innovation District subdivision within the Downs, Esther's Lot U53, Lots 1 through 55. Jamel. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. As you may recall, this item was on the prior agenda in early October, and the applicant's requesting to amend uh, the existing condition of approval related to their main DOT uh, traffic movement permit for the redevelopment project. Uh, so staff in the town's consultants have reviewed the materials, and uh, we're generally comfortable with the materials as presented, and we've provided the 
forward with a draft motion uh, for your consideration this evening. I'll turn it back to you. Thank you, uh, Dan. Would you like to add anything to the discussion here? Um, actually, I'm not. Uh, Tom Erica might say just a few brief words, but to, to be brief as a team, we were. Um, I was going to have Tom do that and turn it back to the board. Thanks. Thanks, Dan. Tom. Good evening, Mr. Chair. Um, um, again, we're we're here seeking approval for um, this item. Um, we've worked very closely with staff and their peer reviewers. Um, we've addressed all the questions and comments as noted in their their um, their peer review comments, um, and um, I'm here to answer any questions. So thank you. Thank you. We do an opportunity for public comment on this. Uh, if there's anyone here in the attendee audience that would like to speak on this topic, please use the raise my hand feature, the lower right hand corner of your browser. Seeing that, I'm going to close public comment and I'm just going to generally open up this, uh, this to the board for any further follow ups. We did spend a considerable amount of time discussing this at the last meeting. Um, does anyone have anything to uh, add or any follow-up questions regarding the information that's been submitted? Jennifer. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I just have a few questions. Um, first, I was just curious, the, <clears throat> the memo that we got from Malone and McBroom was labeled draft. I didn't know if that was actually a draft or maybe just a draft stamp that didn't come off. Um, so if that was going into the record or anything, I just didn't know if that was correct or not. Um, and then I um, we've talked a bit before about the idea of like the scorecard um, or a table to allow us to keep track of um, where we are in terms of uh, permanent trips and then how many of those trips have been um, approved, which I think is great. And this is more a question, I guess, for other um, board members or maybe staff as just kind of a, just throwing it out there. Um, I'm curious about how, so this method seems very clear and very useful for, um, for the innovation district and perhaps for the downs um, in general, we've seen that approach from your um, consultant team on a, on a couple of other projects. But I wonder how that relates to other projects in town or perhaps um, intersections that are on the fringe of what we're looking at now, um, but might be included in down in downs uh, future downs traffic studies or otherwise. Um, and so, you know, I. We, we could, th this feels like a really great and helpful tool to keep track of, you know, one for one trips um, under this lens, but just as a board, I'm curious how um, we might apply that um, or, or be as aware of other projects that we might be looking at in town. And so, for example, I know that you're, a lot of your um, background traffic analyses are looking at a huge number of other developments that you're trying to keep tabs on um, as they pertain to sort of background traffic loading um, with down. Some of those probably will move ahead, some may not. Um, but as a board, I sort of see us as, as having the responsibility of one tier even beyond that, which is um, other projects that, you know, maybe aren't so directly adjacent here, but worthy of our, um, taking into consideration on how that just what that demand looks like for our town in general. Um, so the, that was kind of the big that was kind of my big question. Um, some other and I guess can we just clarify what it is that we're proposing here. This is just this um, a moving of the needle from site plan approval. Uh, so previously what, what had been permitted was that you were required to have your traffic movement permit approved at site plan approval, correct? And now you're asking for that to be moved to a little further on in the game to 
um, to what occupancy to, to account for the current TMP that's being reviewed by by main DOT. So there's a current TMP and that's taking time given given delays in the review and, sure. and the pande pandemic implications. Sure, um, so I'm but, gonna but, ask the million dollar question. Hopefully it's not a million dollars. <laughs> um, do you have a sense for, uh, has DOT given you any sort of update or schedule on when they think they'll be through that? We don't, we don't have a schedule from them. We, we have been in recent conversations about a meeting and, and uh, we are meeting um, with them to kind of discuss the project next week. Um, in fact, we're, we're gonna be putting together a schedule to, to brief them on how we would like to see things unfold from an approval perspective from them. Just, just one thing to keep in mind is that at no point can any of the developments occupy and add traffic to the system. That was sort of the agreement with DOT. There, it's sort of a risk that that the applicant is um, is taking on this, that that they can proceed with the site plan applications and buildings, but they can't occupy until that next TMP is is ultimately um, approved. So there's there's that sort of safety in the whole process. You're, you're not going to see any more traffic till that's that's completed. Okay. Um. I think that's, um, I, you know, I have, this is of interest to me, so I have lots of other questions, but I think in terms of what's been presented, um, that addresses the big ones that I had. Thanks, Jeffrey. Any other questions from the board? Uh, Jamel, could you throw up the uh, motion, please? Uh, one second. I'm working on it. Sorry about that. Okay. Oh, looks like someone else got it before me. <laughs> Thank you, whoever that is, Angela. All right. I move to approve the materials titled the down interim traffic studies and materials prepared by Goral Palmer dated 10 13 20 with the following findings and conditions findings the applicant is proposing to amend the existing condition of approval from the notice of decision dated July 22 2019 condition 3. C related to the approved main DOT traffic movement permit prior to additional site plan approvals within the innovation district subdivision at the downs planning board has reviewed the application and supporting documentation and finds that the materials satisfy this request Conditions one, prior to issuance of a building permit for any additional projects within the Downs development, the applicant shall revise their materials to address the remaining com comments in the peer review memorandum dated 10 2020. This shall be reviewed and approved by the planning department. Two, prior to the issuance of any occupancy for any additional project within the Downs, the applicant shall secure their modified main DOT traffic movement permit. Three, the existing conditions from the July 22, 2019 approval shall remain in effect. That is the motion. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you. Any further discussion on the board? Okay, with that, I'll do a roll call. Rachel Hendrickson. Yes. Rachel? She said yes. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Uh, uh, Jennifer Yeah. Yes. Roger Bealey. Yes. Richard Perry. Yes. Yes. I'm sure, this is unanimous. Thank you and good luck. Thank you. Next item on tonight's agenda is Oyster Development LLC requests a site plan review for lot three within the Innovation District as Assessor's Map U53, lot three. Jamel? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so the applicant here is proposing uh, to construct two single story structures that can be divided up to 10 individual commercial flex spaces for a total aggregate floor area of 22,035 square feet on lot three in the innovation district of the Downs. So the applicant has actually been on the last, the prior uh, two meeting agendas, but the item was tabled both times due to the late hour and lengthy agenda. 
However, uh, the applicant has been responding uh, to each round of comments from peer reviewers and staff. So um, that's the case there. And staff is, so staff has noted that the regulating plan for the innovation district uh, does require a 10 foot wide buffer strip along the innovation way frontage. Uh, due to the proposed stormwater element and grading within the front portion of the site, it appears that the applicants proposing plantings within the innovation way right of way, uh, which is not consistent with the zoning standard. The proposal also depicts wetland impacts west of the site driveway as well. So staff has recommended that the applicant provide the current grading on the site in conditions, existing conditions, to help inform the required landscaping and buffering provisions along Innovation Way. Staff has also noted that there appears to be uh, three areas on the site that, that will result in wetland disturbance due to the proposed grading. Again, staff recommends that the applicant provide the current grading and spot grades at critical locations uh, to ensure wetland, no wetland disturbance on the site. And finally, the applicant, um, since this is the first time um, in front of the board, the applicant should discuss the proposed building design and their uh, proposed uh, interior functionality uh, with the board. I'll turn it back to you at this point. Thanks, Jamel. Mr. Frank, welcome. You're on mute. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate it. Um, I guess I'm gonna try to share my screen here if I can. Oh, maybe it's Dan. I, uh, Dan, are you out there? I was. I just jumped on. I'm. I'm Sean's helper this evening. Um, I'm happy to to help with the graphics uh, for for the board and for Sean. Dan, thank you so much for assisting me in this. Uh, as Jamel said, this is. Uh, we are here on behalf of Oyster Development. Uh, what we are proposing is a, a basically flex space. I think you see them a lot down in the industrial area, right off on Lincoln Avenue is a, is a typical type of a, a scenario um, where we see this as uh, folks moving out of their uh, garages, if you will, and moving into their, uh, uh, to their first spot uh, that, so that they can uh, have their tools, have their equipment and have a small office. So if you look at the in, inside of the building, each one of these spaces is basically a small office with a small ba uh, bathroom. And the rest of it's basically just open space so they can uh, uh, drive their vehicles in, uh, load up for the day. And most of these folks we would be anticipating are going to be electricians, plumbers, those types of things. Uh, they would load up their van and then head off to the actual job site where they'd be working and that we wouldn't have an awful lot of uh, uh, customers or those types of things come into the site. Um, just in terms of uh, the layout of the site itself, as you can see, we are limited uh, by the site and the fact that there is a culvert crossing here with to a wetland. Um, so we have our proposed on a 24 foot wide driveway to come in from the property uh, and throughout the whole site. And that is a waiver request as I understand it because uh, commercial is typically asking for uh, 26 to 30 feet. Again, we think 24 is adequate for the type of uses we're proposing here. We don't anticipate uh, uh, 18 wheelers or those types of things. Uh, and we certainly think that 24 feet in between the pavement and uh, the parking stalls themselves is, is more than sufficient. Um, Along the front of the building, as Jamel stated, uh, the site as it currently is drains from the back to the front. They actually regraded the site, the developer did, uh, which left us with two inlet points to the stormwater management system. Uh, one right there, Dan is, and the other to the left, Dan, where it says seed mix B. Uh, basically, those are the, a low spot within the, uh, within the uh, topography to allow for the uh, collection of stormwater. Um, and then directed it and connect it into the, uh, to the stormwater system within the street. Uh, so what we have proposed, you can see we provided a, a relatively vigorous landscaping plan, uh, but we did propose some as well along the uh, side slopes. That is a fill area for the, for the roadway. It's all fill within there. So there are some side slopes along the roadway going down to the site. Uh, we are proposing actually to, to plant within the wetlands, but we are proposing, if you will, uh, to plant those side slopes going down uh, into, into the property. And if that means we have to obtain some additional topography, uh, just from, a, uh, obviously we base all of our design stuff on uh, available information, uh, but again, we'd certainly be happy to pick up uh, some, some additional topography within those specific areas. Um, but again, I think we have a vigorous landscaping plan there. The, 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 we weren't trying to, uh, uh, to minimize any of the landscape and there is the pathway uh, that goes along uh, the left-hand side, the west of the side. Uh, we are proposing to connect into that. 
Uh, again, some vigorous landscaping associated with it, as well as uh, a, a sidewalk along our parking area, as well as uh, from the back of the, of the building to connect into that, to that walkway. Um, uh, the drainage, as I said, is everything basically from the, uh, the back of the site, the north of the site to the south. Uh, utilities have all been stubbed into the property. Uh, so uh, certainly it's just a matter of extending them throughout. Uh, the lighting will just be a, a building mounted wall packs, uh, LED and full cutoff fixtures. Um, we won't have any new poles proposed out through here at all. Uh, and we have provided uh, uh, radius uh, templates to show that the uh, fire truck can uh, turn around. Uh, Dan, maybe you can go to the next uh, uh, for the building plan for me. Uh, this is a, uh, a, a rendering. Uh, the bottom of the building, the southerly ele elevation, obviously, is is the portion that's facing uh, the roadway. Uh, obviously, the building steps as you work your way back, but it's that front portion that's right up along the road. Uh, and you can see that the uh, the applicant did work with Paco Construction to show uh, uh, a lot of glass within through there, uh, and that so that we did have the 50% uh, uh, fenestration that's required in, in for these front lots uh, within the uh, within the down to the innovation district. Uh, Dan, maybe you can go to the uh, to the uh, two more from here. The next one there. There you go. And again, that one back. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> and, and again, the same type of thing with the uh, the easterly building. Uh, uh, excuse me. Yes, the easterly building. So the same type of thing is that that's the front of the building that faces uh, along the uh, the roadway. Again, added a lot of glass to it, if you will, to make sure that we had, did have the 50% uh, base just upon those types of things. Uh, the top, as you can see, we have basically an overhead door, a man door. Uh, they are proposing a canopy above each man door and enough glass, again, to, uh, to meet the requirements associated with the zone. Um, I, we have received uh, the main elements and the review comments from staff. Uh, again, we are comfortable because the site has all been graded. Uh, and in terms of the grade that I know we are very close to those wetland limits, um, but that we can stay outside of them, we did actually add a, uh, a note to the fact that those limits will actually be staked in the field prior to construction so that we are sure that we aren't impacting those. Uh, but again, I think Jamel requested some additional topographical information. We'd be happy to provide that if, 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 uh, to the staff uh, just to assure to them that uh, there aren't any other things associated with that. So Mr. Chairman, we are requesting the, uh, the two uh, waivers specifically to the driveway width and parking lot aisle width where we are requesting that to be 24. Uh, throughout basically for the whole driveway. Uh, and we are certainly requesting if possible conditional site plan approval tonight uh, with the understanding that there are some minor issues that we'd be happy to address through staff if, uh, if the planning board is comfortable with that. Uh, I know you have a full agenda, Mr. Chairman. So with that, I would conclude my presentation. So I'd be happy to answer any questions the board has. Thank you very much. Thanks, John, I appreciate it. Uh, we have an opportunity for public comment on this item. If you are here from the public and would like to uh, talk about this item, please use the raise my hand feature in the lower right hand corner of your app. All right, seeing no public comment, I'm going to open this up to the board. I've got a quick question. Um, do you have us? Is there, where's the locations for signage for these businesses? Is it basically on the awnings or? Yes, it would be, or, or something along those lines. We are anticipating one, one okay. sign at the entrance. Uh, and then, you know, probably the individual probably on the, on the canopies themselves at each, above each door. All right, thanks. Um, any board members want to discuss uh, a question from um, the main elements of the proposal? Uh, specifically, I think we're a little bit worried about the, the vicinity of some of these trees into the wetlands. Um, Sean, did you want to cover that real quick again? Yes, I would. And again, the intent of that, again, it's, I think it's right along the uh, innovation way that we're talking about. Um, and the intent basically was to, again, that's, that's all a fill area in through there. Uh, so there is a, a fill slope that's associated with innovative way. Uh, and again, uh, as, because of the drainage issues and just in terms of the 10 feet, again, we didn't want to act like we were trying to skimp on landscape and that's not our intent. So our thought was uh, because of the drainage issues here that we would basically just landscape those side slopes and uh, the fill slopes, if you will, associated with the roadway. So that's the whole intent of the, of the, uh, the landscaping shown on both sides of the driveway was basically just to uh, landscape those fill slopes uh, that were created in, in accordance with the construction of innovation way itself. All right. Thanks, Sean. 
Uh, board members, I'll just open it up in general for anyone that has a question either regarding their main elements or their waivers. Rachel? Yeah, um, I have uh, I have no problem with the waivers. Um, I have a question. Uh, I, are the colors as you show them on this on these slides, is that uh, your proposal? Yes, it is. Uh, yes, and I'm sorry, thank you for bringing that up. Uh, at least at this point in time, I think they got just talking those uh, those muted colors associated with the building. Okay, so sort of a silvery gray and with black detailing. Yes, and I apologize, Rachel. I don't know if I have those on mine right here. Um, they did call them out on one of the building plans, uh, just to be sure. It's a it's a cool Arctic white, believe it or not, is what they call them. The uh, the main panels themselves. Um, And they do have that uh, split face block, which is a cool zinc gray along the bottom. Okay. <clears throat> um, one of the things that that, uh, that I don't see, um, but that increasingly as we uh, start to adapt to these issues of COVID and people, uh, the importance of people meeting outside upon occasion uh, do you see places where you could put some outside, uh, some benches, um, places for people to sit down outside? I, I do, Rachel. What I would see it is, is probably in the back of the building on the west and all the way to the back. Um, again, the area to the front is really, it, those are two depressional areas uh, from a grading perspective. Mm -hmm. um, I would say behind the building on the east, that's a little tight in through there just because it's basically uh, uh, the building, uh, the, the emergency sidewalk to access the, uh, the doors to the back and get them out to the front. And we have a, uh, a, a, um, a French drain back there as well with an under drain to connect uh, to make sure we pick up all the runoff and get that into the system. So I wouldn't say there's an awful lot on the easterly side, but I would say that there is on the westerly side and the side of the building. How about near the, uh, how about, and forgive me on the directions, I just say, you know, right, left, things like that. Uh, how about in what lo appears to be a cleared area near the trail is between the, the say right there, yeah, no, down, down, right, there you go. That That's a, that's kind of a drainage collection area, but if we went up, if you could go up, Dan, a little bit uh, on the other side of that other landscaping, um, right, yeah, and right there, be, that would certainly, that's an upland area. Um, that's uh, just going to be loamed and seeded right there, and uh, it is next to the trails as well. Well, I, I think that's the sort of thing that, first of all, provides a little respite for people coming in along the trails and allows employees of uh, uh, the businesses to meet with customers or just to sit down and you know have a have a little rest. So I I, I would urge you to find a couple of places um, where they could where you could put some. Uh, benches, uh, some meeting places. As I said, I think uh, the last few months have taught us the importance of being able to to get together uh, in in the air, in the plain air, rather than uh, inside the building. So well, that's a good point, that. Rachel. And to be honest with you, I, I haven't discussed that at all with the applicant, but I'd be more than happy to have that conversation. And again, certainly uh, the idea of putting a couple of benches or picnic tables or something like that to be able to meet outside, I'm sure would uh, would be no issue at all. Yeah, I, I would uh, suggest that the, ben the benches are, are fixed so that they don't up and walk away. Picnic tables, and that they do up and walk away, and it's sometimes and it's kind of you know tough to show them on the plans and then keep track. But um, I, and as I'm looking at the the dumpster at the very back, is that correct? Right there. Yes, it is. Okay. Um. Yeah, I, I'm satisfied with the landscape out there. All right, thank you. Thanks, Rachel. Any other members of the board with questions or comments? Right, Roger. Roger, you're on mute. Okay, I'm basically uh, satisfied with what's been presented so far with the understanding that they're going to work on those, um, that landscaping um, by the, uh, the roadway there. Um, but I do have a question just out of uh, curiosity for Dan. Um, when, when different projects, um, when you're talking to um, 
prospects for different projects and they they present a um, design for the the structure I are you guys trying to lend them in with existing structures that are already in the works um, if somebody came up with some really extreme design would you try and influence them that we want to try and keep it somewhat compatible with what, what else is going on well that's where the the design guidelines and the fenestration requirements were we're really expecting those to to dictate design um, so there is not a you know a robust like internal design review process by by the downs it's meeting the, the design guidelines and, and um, working through the planning board review process that we rely on. Okay, all right. Um, I, I guess I'm all set. Uh, but through the chair, Mr. Chairman, I would be clear that uh, we did forward, you know, uh, uh, these renderings uh, uh, to Dan's team, uh, and we did provide the uh, traffic memo to Dan's team as well so that uh, uh, he could kind of start that whole process of uh, uh, you know, keeping the scorecard, if you will, for a lot development in terms of traffic impacts as well. Yeah, absolutely. We, yeah, I wasn't suggesting we weren't coordinated, um, Roger or John. It was just that we we felt that these met the design guidelines and we're coordinating on traffic, as Sean indicated, um, per the last discussion you just had. Okay. All right, thanks. Mr. Chair, can I um, just follow up with something Roger mentioned? Sure, go ahead, Angela. Um, I just wanted to clarify before we go through all the planning board members that one of the things um, I know Roger mentioned at the beginning about them working on the landscape along the front and what I heard from Sean is that they're just planning on the slope so they're not revising the landscaping. And so I guess just from my point of view in the field, I would like to get some clarification um, just because as we're out there and during construction, it appears that most of this landscaping, while it's still robust, as Sean had mentioned, they wanna keep it as much, but it's all within the right of way. So I think there's some concern, I guess, from my point of view being in the field and field changes coming up, I'd like to know what the intent is and maybe some more information or some guidance, I guess, from the planning board, because that could um, interfere, say, with winging, our winging back of snow um, banks and things like that. So, and also future maintenance, who's doing that? It's all within the town, like a future town right away. So there's some concern of my, especially as it, it, it grades down in. So there's gonna be a lot of snow kind of flying down that, um, that side slope. So I just wanna make sure we get um, some clear kind of direction from planning board on that. So that if that's the intent, then I'm gonna hold it to them in the field. And there's also, I think street trees and maybe Dan can clarify that. Are there already street trees proposed within the town right away? There are, yeah. And the street trees are proposed within the right of way uh, today. I think Sean's showing supplemental landscaping is my understanding. Okay, and there is overhead wire along that side too, correct? correct. So where, how those all play in, I just want to make sure because I feel like I might be in a position where they're going to be asking for field changes out there to try to make this work. And I would, it'd be helpful to get the planning board kind of give me some guidance on that. I could also jump in and just like to note that the regulating plan, which is the zoning standards for the district require a 10 foot wide landscape buffer. So I, I see the intention. I just don't know that planting the buffer within the right of way is really what you know staff is looking for. Well, through the chair, if I could, would, ask. if I'm understanding this correct, though, to put the buffer, they would have to move the plantings into the wetlands. Is that the is that really what the land is telling us? Um, in staff's memos, we've been really noting the to the to the east or to the right of the driveway is where our comments have been focusing. Um, just because the building is so close to the right of way, whereas on the other side, there's wetlands and there are some trees between the trail and the building. So we haven't really been focusing on on that part of the site to meet the standards. That's uh, helpful. Jamel, do you mean that the uh, the trees to the, the right, are you suggesting that they be moved closer to the building away from the uh, away from the uh, right of way? Yeah, correct. So the 10 foot buffer is measured from the property line. Um, so from the property line into the site, but 
then as we were looking at the plan, staff did notice that there's some there's a stormwater element there. So it seemed like there was it was hard to to fit in what is required per the zoning. So that's why we noted it. So so Jamal, what do you sit, what are you recommending on the on the left side of the driveway then? Other, other than the trees that are going to be part of the right of way. Are you are you recommending nothing right there then and just yeah, I don't think we want to see trees planted in the wetlands or in the right of way. Um, so I, I could ask you know, Angela could, could jump in about wetland disturbance, but certainly that's not where we're looking to have landscaping planted um, just to be consistent. Well, again, Mr. Chairman, if I can just add something, and I, I appreciate, thank you, Jamel, for, and, and maybe I was the one misunderstanding that. I, well, actually, I'm sure I was the one misunderstanding it. It's what it usually comes down to. Um, but I would be happy to, uh, where, where Dan's hand is now, is to eliminate that landscape in there and certainly provide some more buffering over through there. And, and you're right, there is, like I said, there is a drainage feature over there, um, but I understand where you're coming from now. I certainly think we can maybe get that out of the right of way, maybe work that into that slope a little bit, or maybe even, you know, play with that drainage just for here. But uh, again, if the board's comfortable, I'd be more than happy to work with uh, with Jamel on that. I appreciate where Angela's coming from in terms of getting that out of the right of way. Again, we were just trying to provide some type of buffer because we were having a hard time with that 10 feet because of the wetlands right there. But if everyone's comfortable with that, we could, uh, you know, lose the landscaping on the westerly side of the driveway and rework the right side a bit, if you will, in terms of providing some some more landscape within that area and maybe just play with the drainage a little bit in that area if, if, if the board's comfortable with that. Jamel, is that reflected in the uh, motion you have drafted some of those conditions? Uh, yeah, if the board gets there. I think we um, can either amend it a little bit or if you guys are comfortable, I think we uh, use the language that, to address that. Yeah, I think we, I think at Angela's point as well, just when they get into the field, having, helping her with some clarity and then uh, Mr. Frank here's willingness to help uh, modify that with staff to get it to where everyone's on the same page. It would would be fine by me. Jennifer. Um, I just want to clarify and because I thought Jamel that you were I sort of understood the opposite of what Mr. Frank was explaining, which was that you're not looking for additional or more robust landscaping on the westerly side of the driveway because of the wetlands, but instead looking for more landscaping on the easterly side. Yeah, I think that's what Sean was alluding okay. to. Is that correct, Sean? Ahead. Yes, what I was talking about was was removing the landscaping from the right of way westerly of the driveway. Okay. All right, and installing more landscaping easterly of the driveway. Okay, that's that that's what I heard Jamal say too. Um, okay. And I would only add to that, wondering if there's the possibility at all of perhaps shifting that drainage structure. Um, in that little pocket of space to the east, you kind of have it right in the middle. And I wonder if there's any opportunity for kind of sliding it a little bit one way or the other, um, which might allow you to not only pull the plantings that you have on the line right now back onto the property, but maybe even double up and have that just be a little bit deeper, which I think is kind of in the intent of what um, the type of buffering that we're looking for. Yeah, and again, Jennifer, I'd be happy, and that's when I said play. The only thing is, is I do know it was all based, obviously, on the inlet that was provided by the developer, which is pretty much at that location we were showing the low spot. Yeah. Um, but I, I'll look at that. One of my other thought was, and again, I can I'll, I'll talk to the developers. Maybe even look at perhaps maybe get a structure in there, perhaps you know. Um, again, I, I'd be happy to just take a little look at that so that maybe we can get that additional landscaping in there. Um, and kind of pretty up that cornfield. And again, I don't have I don't have any other comments other than to just um, I do think fully making sure that the landscaping is fully out of the right of way, particularly if there are overhead wires and other street trees planted. Um, having just dealt with a number of very mature trees on. Uh, whose side of the property line we were not quite sure in our own um, our own house it gets a little it gets a little sticky down the road when people aren't you know not 
they didn't listen in on this meeting and <laughs> things are overgrown, so. No, I appreciate that. What I will do, and, I, and I, Angela had brought up a very good point. Again, we were just trying to give options there, but that's, a, that's an excellent point. We will make sure that the landscaping is, is completely out of the, uh, uh, the proposed town right of way and, and just on the property. Do I have any other questions from the board members? Okay. I wanted to uh, ask a question, if you don't mind, Mr. Chair. Sure. Uh, I, I know Rachel ahead, noted the benches and picnic tables, so I wasn't sure if other board members wanted to chime in on that. Before I we think, yeah, I think a you know picnic bench or a, a picnic table or something added to the plan would be nice. Nice. Uh, so these days I do notice a lot more businesses having an outdoor meeting of sorts or at least having their lunches out there. Um, maybe not so much in the winter, we'll find out. But uh, yeah, wouldn't hurt to add one or two spots like that on the on the site. Um, uh, and also just, uh, I'll just throw it out there, knowing the uh, types of end users that are probably moving in here, sometimes those are used as designated smoking areas on a, a property like this. We have shared spaces, so wouldn't be a bad thing. All right, um, uh, Rick to Perry, did you have something to add? No, I just was wanted to say I thought Rachel did a good job of covering it, and of course you did a good job of reinforcing it. I just wanted to. I I also agree. I just didn't want to take up the time of the board and the applicant restating what I, what you guys have said. So you did a good job. It'd be nice to have a picnic table. Thanks, Rick. Um, so with that, uh, Jamel, do you have a uh, motion available for us to review? And I also just um, just want to make sure that the board knows that there are a couple waiver requests. I didn't hear anyone comment on it. Uh, they were uh, de minimis in, in what it was uh, during the request for what they uh, pavement with and, and whatnot. So I didn't see any red flags there. So we've made a few changes to the motion. So I'm going to go ahead and and say, share that right now. If the board's ready, thanks, Jamal. You guys see that? Okay. Yes. Okay. Just scroll up a little for me. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, I move to the site plan project titled commercial flex space as depicted on the plan set prepared by Sebago Technics stated 10920 with the following findings, waivers and conditions. Findings, the applicant is proposing to construct two single story structures that can be divided up to 10 individual commercial flex spaces for a total aggregate floor area of 22,035 square feet. The proposal also consists of landscaping provisions and parking. Projects are located on lot three of the innovation district subdivision is within the crossroads plan development CPD zoning district. Planning Board has reviewed the application and supporting documentation and finds that the proposed design on the site plan adequately addresses site plan review, zoning ordinance, and the innovation district regular requirements for site utilization and layout, access, internal vehicular movement, parking, pedestrian ways, landscaping, stormwater management, lighting, architecture, signage, utilities, and storage. Waivers, one, permit the proposed driveway width of 24 feet. Two, permit the proposed parking aisle width of 24 feet. Conditions, one, Prior to the issuance of a building permit, the applicant shall revise the plan set to include A, modifications to the proposed landscaping and grading along the front of the property line, as noted in the staff review memo. B, the addition of current grading and spot grades at critical locations on the site, as noted in the staff review memo, dated 10 26 20. C, a plan note referencing section 2D29 in the zoning ordinance, which related to the timing of trail construction associated with the Innovation District subdivision. E, the fenestration percentages on the building elevations for the primary and secondary elevations. F, a plan note referring to the most recent recorded subdivision plan with recording information. G, provide additional benches along the trail in accordance with the deliberation. This shall be reviewed and approved by the planning department. Two, prior to the issuance of a building permit, the applicant shall A, pay the traffic impact fees. B, provide the approval by the Portland Water District. C, provide approval by the Scarborough Sanitary District. D, address the comments in the pe civil peer review memo from Woodard and Curran dated 10 20 This shall be reviewed and approved by the planning department. Three, 
prior to the issuance of a sign permit, the I had a final signage plan. This shall be reviewed and approved by the planning department. Four, prior to the start of construction, a pre-construction meeting is required. The meeting shall include appropriate town staff, the developer, and their site contractor, and is to be coordinated through the planning department. Five, prior to the issuance of a certificate of occupancy, a copy of the modified main DOT traffic movement permit shall be submitted to the planning department. That is the motion. Do I have a second? Second. I have a second. Any further discussion from the board? Seeing none, I will call the roll. Roger Beely. Yes. Rachel Hendrickson. Yes. Rick DuPerry. Yes. Jennifer Ladd. Yes. Nick McGee. Yes. So that is unanimous. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Next item on tonight's agenda is Logos LLC requests a site plan review for lot 54 with Within the Innovation District, the Decessors Map U53, Lot 54. No. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so the applicant here is proposing to construct a 10,000 square foot building that will consist of 5,240 square feet uh, for Zoom drains, business operations, and 4,760 square feet of open tenant space uh, located on Lot 54 in the Innovation District subdivision. So again, this applicant has actually been on the planning board's last two agendas. Uh, both times the item has been tabled due to the late hour and the lengthy agenda, uh, but the applicant has been responding to uh, peer and staff review comments in the process. Um, so at this point, uh, staff is generally comfortable with the proposal as presented and has provided the board with a draft motion. I'll turn it back to you. Thank you, Jamel. Uh, Dan or Nancy. It's Nancy. All right, Nancy, here we go. Thank you for the meeting. Been on the meeting and it has allowed us to come in and request the opportunity to actually go through the two rounds of review, staff review, peer review, uh, comments and responses. So uh, we are at the point where the staff memoranda that we believe is pretty straightforward and we would like to. Uh, be in order for site plan uh, approval tonight with appropriate conditions. Um, this building is something that you folks actually saw um, back in December of 2019 on lot six in the Innovation District. It's a 10,000 square foot uh, building, which is- I'm so, I'm, Nancy, I'm sorry to interrupt, but your audio seems broken. Is, is that only on my end or is that everybody else as well? Is our audio okay for everybody yeah, else other than me? Yeah, it's breaking up. It's not, the quality is not good. It's a little it low. It seems like you have some sort of reverb and into, some sort of echo or reverb into your microphone, so. Are you on speakerphone? Uh, no, I'm actually just on the laptop. That's a lot better from my end. Yeah. All right, so um, I just got closer. So, <clears throat> Uh, as we noted, we're proposing the 10,000 square foot building. Uh, it is home to Zoom Drain, uh, as well as additional tenant space at the south side of the building. Uh, this is located on lot 54 in the Innovation District, and it is located at the uh, southwesterly end of the private way, which is now called uh, Immersion Drive. And uh, as part of our process, uh, going through the review, we've made some modifications with additional landscaping and other site refinements uh, to the extent that we are um, proposing the plan that you see before you in the uh, colored rendering. The plan provides a loop circulation pattern around the site in this fashion and comes back out. This is Immersion Drive. There is parking on this side of the building for Zoom drain and along here. There are overhead doors on this side of the building and this side of the building. And there's parking spaces the, down here for the tenants. Excuse me, Nancy, are you referring to something that, that could be on the screen? Yeah, she's, she should be sharing something on the screen. Do you, do you have it on your screen sharing or? No. No. All right, let's see. Jamel, can you let me share? 
did you send the materials? Do you want me to? Yes, I pull did. it up. All right, let's see what I can do. I don't think anyone's sharing, Nancy. I don't know what's going on. <laughs> Um, there are three files. Which one did you want me to bring up? Uh, it's it's 2043S render. Okay. Thanks, Angela. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you, Angela. Can everyone see it now? Yes, you can, Nancy. Thank you. All right. Sorry about that. Thank you, Angela. <laughs> so this plan uh, is, uh, as I had noted, a circulation pattern sort of around the building uh, in, a, in a loop fashion. As you can see on the plan in the uh, upper end on the north end, that's Immersion Drive. And we tie in at two points uh, and we circulate around the building. So the north face of the building is the location for Zoom Drain, and it has parking along the, the north side and along portions of the northeast and the northwest side of the building, uh, as well as parking along the southerly side of the building for the tenant spaces that are located in the south portion of the building. There are overhead doors on the east and the west side this allows the zoom drain vehicles to uh, drive through uh, the building. Uh, it also allows the tenant spaces to be divided up so we could have either one tenant in the south end or two separate tenants. Um, and <clears throat> so uh, with that, we're looking to uh, provide any uh, answers to any of your questions that you have, uh, but we are seeking, as I noted, uh, site plan approval for the building. Uh, we have the memoranda that's been received. Uh, the one item that was uh, noted was just approved by you folks tonight uh, at the beginning of the meeting. We do have three waiver requests that we're asking for. Those are cited in the staff memo as well. They pertain to driveway width, driveway separation, and the parking lot aisle width with a reduction from 25 feet down to 24 feet. Uh, with that, uh, Angela, do you have the building model? That would be the architectural binder for this. Yep. There you go. Uh, I just wanted to give you folks a model view uh, of the building so you could see colors. And this would be the approach to the building as you're coming in off of Immersion Drive. Um, so with that, I will open it up to you folks for any questions that you may have. Uh, and uh, as I said, we feel it's a straightforward view at this point. Thanks, Nancy. Appreciate it. So members, uh, I'm sorry, we have opportunity for public comment tonight. If you are here in attendance and would like to speak on this item, please use the raise my hand feature in the bottom right hand corner. I'm seeing none, I'm gonna close public comment. Do you have any questions from the board? As the applicants noted, we had seen this before, just at a different location. Rachel. Yeah, um, first of all, I, I wanna compliment uh, you again on the, uh, the architecture. I know we wrestled that to the ground uh, earlier um, and I, I think uh, it's an interesting architecture and I'm glad to see it there. I'm glad to see Zoom Grain back. I do have a question on one of the waivers and you're asking for a driveway of 55 feet. How did you get to that number? The, um, the southerly, that's the southerly driveway on the site. And it, the width of it is dictated by two different things. One is those overhead doors that are on the easterly side of the building and the need to be able to get a vehicle to access into or out of those doors and get back up onto uh, Immersion Drive. 
at the southerly end of that limit, it allows a vehicle coming around the building uh, to be able to come back out onto Immersion Drive as well. In addition, this point on the southerly end uh, of the site at the end of uh, Innovation, uh, excuse me, Immersion Drive uh, is coincident with the proposed southerly entrance limit on the adjacent lot, which is also on the end of the agenda tonight. So we did some coordination uh, sort of in-house with those two plans so that we knew what was going on between the two. Uh, you folks haven't seen that yet, but um, that's sort of how that southerly end came about. It also allows a truck that circulates around the building, a larger truck, such as a trailer truck, to be able to get out and back onto uh, Immersion Drive. Thank you. Appreciate the, appreciate the explanation. All right, any other questions from the board? Um, Jamel, can you throw up the motion for us? Angela, you mind doing that? Sorry. Yep. I know I have all of them up. Next. Okay. All right, I move to approve the site plan project zoom drain as depicted in the plan set prepared by St. Clair Associates dated 10920 with the following findings, waivers, and conditions. Findings. The applicant is proposing to construct a 10,000 square foot building that will consist of 5,000 and 240 square zoom drains business operations and 4,760 square feet of open tenant space. The proposal also consists of parking and landscaping provisions. The project is located at the end of Immersion Drive, a private access drive on lot 54 of the Innovation District subdivision and is with us roads plan development in the CPD zoning district. The planning board has reviewed the application and supporting documentation and finds that the proposed design and site plan accurately addresses the site plan review, zoning ordinance, and the Innovation District regulation regulating plan requirements for site utilization and layout access, internal vehicular movement, parking, pedestrian ways, landscaping, stormwater management, lighting, architecture, signage, utilities, and storage. Waivers, one, permit the proposed driveway width of 55 feet for the southerly driveway. Two, permit the proposed driveway separation of 46 feet. Three, permit the proposed parking aisle width of 24 feet. Conditions, prior to the of a building permit, the applicant shall revise the plan set to include A, the proposed materials and colors on the building elevations. B, Underground utilities along which drop approved by the planning board. This shall be reviewed and approved by the planning department. Two, prior to issuance of a building permit, the applicant shall pay the traffic impact fees. Three, prior to issuance of a sign permit, the applicant shall provide a final signage plan. This shall be reviewed and approved by the planning department. Four, prior to the start of construction, a pre construction <laughs> meeting is required. Meeting shall include appropriate town staff, the developer, and their site contractor, and is to be coordinated to the planning department. Five, prior to issuance of a certificate of occupancy, a copy of the modified MDOT traffic movement permit shall be submitted to the planning department. That is the motion. Do I have a second? Second. I have a second. Any further discussion from the board? <clears throat> Being on a call roll, Roger Bealey. Yes. Rachel Hendrickson. Yes. Rick DuPerry. Yes. Jennifer Ladd. Yes. Nick McGee. Yes. So that's unanimous. Congratulations and good luck. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, next item tonight. Item number, uh, number item number eight, Tim, and Hebert, uh, Tim Hebert and Jack Sully request a sketch plan review for 246 US Route 1 on assessment map three, lot 56. Uh, We'll make a quick note of this that uh, the applicant has submitted um, additional plans on this that were received this evening. So uh, I, don't, I don't know how, how far we go with our review of this. I think their intention here is to really have give us a, a peek at the overall plan. Uh, I'll let uh, Jamel get into uh, the rest of the description, but just to give everyone the heads Jamel, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so the applicants in front of you all tonight for a sketch plan review, uh, actually for the former town public safety building located along Route 1 um, in the Oak Hill neighborhood. Uh, just a quick reminder that sketch plan review is an opportunity for the applicant and the board to have a high level discussion 
uh, to help inform the formal submission uh, in the future. So the applicant's proposing to renovate the existing building on the property into a two tenant building. Uh, the applicant's also proposing to construct a new building on the property, uh, which is pr proposed to be a new bank uh, with drive-through service. Um, so staff did uh, provide some comments related to uh, access management um, and the site plan review standard um, that relates to a, pro a site has access on two or more streets. Um, since the board has had some challenges in the past uh, related to access management along the Route 1 corridor, I uh, just wanted to note that um, this will be, I think the Route 1 access will be an important discussion point uh, to help inform the formal submission. Staff has also noted that where parking is permitted or proposed along the front yard setback uh, between the Route 1 and the building, um, that a buffer needs to be provided to help screen uh, parking in the area. And staff did offer several other high level comments um, within the staff review memo um, that uh, if the board has questions, staff's uh, happy to answer those. At this point, I'll turn it back to you. Thanks, Jamal. Appreciate it. Uh, Mr. LaBelle or Mr. Hebert? Sam, do you want me to take the lead? Yep, sounds good. Okay. Uh, first, I uh, just wanted to clarify the information presented or represented tonight. Um, I don't think we have a large material change in the um, direction of the site from an overall master plan uh, development, but really um, when we submitted, we expected, um, we had serious discussions with the operators of what you're looking at right now, which is the, the old uh, fire station. Um, and those tenants have much like most tenants that would be normal slam dunks for this building have um, gotten cold feet as a result of COVID-19. Um, so we're struggling a little bit right now, but nevertheless, the overall uh, master plan and the intent of this building is, and, and the buildings that we're showing in the master plan are, um, are of relevance in our discussion tonight. So that's the only difference is that, you know, our phase one, we were expecting to be moving forward with um, developing the fire sp station for a specific um, tenant and, uh, and it's not, it's, you know, that, that tenant is no longer with us. So uh, that is what I know about that. Sam, if you want to go to the plan itself. So this is the plan of the existing conditions as we know it today. Um, and one of the comments, um, the staff's review comments from the previous uh, October 5th letter was to reduce the length of the curb cut along Route 1 and create a buffer. And uh, that is in, in what, our, what we're intending to show if you go to the next slide here. This is our master plan. Um, so the only, like I said, the only real change in the information that we're looking at today versus what we submitted is the fact that we had anticipated on only presenting the front portion of the lot. When I say front, the, the side uh, closest to Route 1, which would consist of a new uh, potential branch bank and renovating the existing fire station into a uh, more of a retail grocer um, application. As I said, overall, this is still very relevant to what our intentions are. And we're working with um, a traffic engineer and ACORN engineering to uh, further this design and uh, hopeful tomorrow even that we'll be talking to some folks uh, about the fire station that are uh, very similar in use. So what we're hoping to do today is to uh, get some staff comment back on uh, the location of the entrance on Route 1 and the purpose of this site plan. Um, we've also uh, are looking at the um, building a new building on the back corner of the site too that would house uh, roughly 30 uh, senior affordable units, housing units. 
Sam, you want to add anything else to that? Yeah, ha happy to jump in here. Um, I was also just going to kind of give um, give a view from the sky and, um, you know, I'm sure most board members are familiar with the site as this uh, was recently rezoned to the TVC district earlier in the spring, but uh, here we are outlined in red. Um, you know, to the north, you've got the high school, the east is Amato's and, and the Black Point Gorham Route 1 intersection, um, and mostly single family neighbors to, to the southwest. Um, yet to date, we've had a pre-application meeting with town staff who submitted the sketch plan application and responded to one round of comments. Um, and yeah, very, very pleased to be in front of you tonight with, with this exciting redevelopment. Um, you know, as Tim mentioned, we did, you know, there's a slight, a slight change from the, the phase one plan that we previously submitted, which is, isn't quite relevant anymore. So we figured it'd be more constructive to, to just get the master plan in front of you and, uh, you know, get some initial feedback that, that we can take once we prepare the site plan application. So as Tim mentioned, this mixed mix use approach with 30 residential units um, working clockwise around the site, you've got the old police station, um, which ideally would be office and other tenants, as well as a community room for the residential. Um, ideally a proposed grocer retail at the bottom left, um, and then currently what's proposed as a bank at the top left. And as Tim mentioned, we are, you know, one of the main focuses here was the the route one and, and the treatment of this buffer. So, you know, just flipping back and forth a couple times, you can kind of see the drastic change where we're reducing that curb cut by 85 feet. Um, and, and we've reduced the only movement to a one way in down to 12 feet. Um, so we've, we've studied the circulation a fair amount and after many, many design iterations, um, we chose this for two, two reasons. Um, you know, first, this is pretty critical to these two retail components and the bank without this driveway. Um, these two building frontages become a lot less attractive from a business perspective. And two, in this scenario, we actually think it's beneficial for the site and adjacent neighborhood um, to have this enter only lane, which would serve a good portion of the entering traffic. It really does help kind of break up the entering trip distribution. And then of course, when customers leave, they'll need to filter out to the side streets. So the safer entering movement will be allowed off route one and the more involved exiting movement will have to happen from a formal street intersection. So overall, this is a bit of a challenging site from a traffic perspective, given its proximity to the Route 1 Gorham intersection. But we do feel as though we're on the right track here uh, with a workable solution, which this, of course, will be further outlined uh, in a traffic analysis once we uh, submit the site plan application. With, inter with uh, regards to internal circulation, pretty self-explanatory um, on the right side of the site. For, for the left, I guess the bank, um, you know, could either be accessed by parking in front or finding your way to the queue line for the drive-through that we've placed at the back of the site. Um, you know, the rest of it is, is pretty well accessed from, from the side streets for the residential and the former police station. Um, Along Route 1, in, in addition uh, to the curb cut improvements, I, I would just add that we are intending to, to implement a pretty robust 15 foot wide um, landscaping treatment with some interest and some great change, um, as well as a rebuilt sidewalk along that frontage. Looking at Fairfield Road at the top of the page, we've actually turned the corner with the buffer, so not just focusing on Route 1, um, but closing these two curb cuts as well and providing the only access, you know, really pushing that driveway off the intersection as much as possible. Um, and so, you know, wrapping this buffer around the corner, creating a safer site as well as, as a more attractive site. 
So um, the, the last point here I want to add is from a parking perspective, the initial calculations based on our desired land uses do result in a, in a plan that's appropriately parked. And as part of that, we will be looking to implement shared use parking strategies uh, where it makes sense. So the idea of getting as close to 24 hours out of a parking space per day is the goal. So we're being as efficient uh, with the impervious area as possible. And these numbers will be dialed in um, as we get close to, closer to the end users. So this plan and program uh, before you really is a celebration of the mixed use approach with up to 30 new residential units, employment opportunities um, and goods and services. One thing you'll notice is the opportunity for placemaking and just the overall pedestrian scale. We're really trying to create a downtown campus feel within the site itself. You know, as mentioned, intending to meet the parking requirement, but the goal is to not let vehicles dominate the design. Um, so overall, while the site does not come without its challenges, uh, this is a very important redevelopment project and um, we're excited to start the discussions tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we do have opportunity for public comment this evening. If you're here in attendance and would like to speak on this item, please use the raise my hand feature in the bottom uh, corner of your Zoom app. All right, seeing none. I'll turn this over to the board. Uh, I got a quick question before we get too far into it. Um, I don't know if uh, you can't see where I'm pointing my, my but the proposed common residential amenity space and potential future tenants building. Does that read the same on this plan that you have shown on the screen? Uh, in our packet, it was the proposed common residential amenity space and potential future tenant. Yes, that building. Bill, please build it. Yeah, I believe that reads the same as, as what's in your packet. Some of the other labels we might have just um, given a, a bit of a more generic land use. Okay, so I guess my question is, and I understand that, you know, you can't, there's no crystal ball and you don't know what that's going to look like. I think, um, it, does that have the potential to be turned into to more residential units? No. It does not. The, the well, not without um, not within the current zoning. Okay, and and, and it is not is not our intention to do so. My 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 the reason I was bringing that up is my concern was the amount of parking if it had the ability to turn into more potential residential uses. Then I, I would worry that your site would be a lack of parking um, down the road. So. Could you could you just give me an example of some of the spaces that you could foresee in that building potentially? Sure. Um, so we've met with a, uh, a small gym. Uh, we've met with uh, a dog groomer. We've met with a car detailer. We think about the building as a smaller makerspace type um, multi-tenant professional office building. So one of our intentions on this building is to get rid of the stigma of the police station and change the two entrances front and back of the site so that they have a much, much more residential professional office building feel. Um, it's something we'll be looking to, uh, to do relatively soon, uh, uh, you know, given approval from the, from the town of Scarborough. Um, but, but essentially we see the police station, it could be one, insurance company, for example, it could be uh, likely we're anticipating it's going to be, you know, somewhere between two and five smaller 2000 square foot, you know, professional tenants, office kind of space or, or maker space tenants. So there's two existing garage door bays out back. And those, um, for example, might might lend themselves to a potter or something of that nature. So we envision this site, and, and one of the reasons, to be honest with you, we've had um, people come to us or to our real estate agent for the fire station, for example, and um, we just didn't feel that, that the 
proposed, those proposed tenants would blend well with what we're trying to create here, which is like a little town village center, essentially. Um, no pun intended with the zoning, but um, we really see this being a walkable uh, landscape and something that can lend itself to people that are living on site and also have the ability to maybe go and get their hair cut, maybe go to a, a small uh, grocer, maybe a wine bar of, of sorts and a bank and, and really have a, a community feel to it. That's our goal for this for this project. Thank, thank you, uh, Sam. Uh, any board members want to quickly look at? I know Jamel, you're you're largely interested here in. A specific opinion on the Route One entrance. Is that, is that um, I'm interested in everything, but you know, <laughs> that's been challenged. That's been a challenging exercise for the planning board. So I just wanted to bring it up. That's all. <laughs> Thanks. Sure. I can. I mean, I can comment on that if you'd like, Jamel. This is Tim Hebert. Um, you know, we, we recognize that, um, you know, we're, we're stuck between two cross streets, Fairfield and, and Westwood. And uh, we were working with Tom um, from, for DOT and traffic movement plan. And, you know, right now it seemed appropriate to kind of split the middle um, of, the, of the site uh, from that location to enter in only. Um, whether that moves down closer to Westwood um, or for, further uh, towards Fairfield is a, is a piece that we will be studying from a traffic movement standpoint. Um, you know, there's civil designs relative to adjacencies across Route 1 and turning traffic. Um, and we're looking at all of those things to, to study it better and, and determine or try to determine what the best traffic movement will be in and out of and around the site. We're also, uh, with respect to some of the staff comments previously, we didn't talk about yet, but uh, the memorial that's, um, that's on Route 1 right now, one of the comments was to ensure that we relocate that or look to relocate that within the site, which we are doing. Um, one of the proposed uh, was to try to put it in the plaza where the mouse is right now, where you can see in the middle of the site and make it be a feature that people can um, see and respect rather than something that's just stuck somewhere on the corner of the site or in the middle of where nobody really goes. Um, but that's obviously, you know, we'd, we'd be open to discussion about where that goes, you know, on the site if someone has a strong opinion one way or the other. We also, sure, we, you know, we also recognize that, you know, we look, for this site to be, as you can see, kind of the hatched areas within for it to be walkable, um, not only for the tenants herein, but also just from a community standpoint. Um, so having soft access and making it pedestrian friendly um, for the neighborhood so people can feel comfortable walking around and they don't feel like they're walking through a parking lot. That was very important to us. Thanks, Roger. Yes, um, I, I think this is uh, pretty exciting, um, but I do have a couple of questions. Um, the thing that stood out to me Im immediately was the entryway off of Fairfield Road, because um, that's a two-way entry and exit, where off of Route 1 is going to be a right in, right out only. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. It's uh, uh, off of Route 1. You, you're talking about the entrance on Route One to the property, yes. or you? Yeah, that's yes. going to be a, an entrance only, not entrance and exit. Okay, so somebody driving south on Route One, and they want to come into this property, you're either going to have to cross over on Fairfield, or cross over onto Westwood. And I'm just concerned that Fairfield is so close to that intersection that that's going to be a problem where on Westwood, I noticed you only have an ex uh, the, the um, exit closest to Route 1. It's only an exit only. Um, 
would it make any sense to make that you know exit as well as an entry we can certainly look at that one of the reasons why we made that an exit only um, as you can see if you if you uh, go further down westwood you can see that the um, the uh, the the next entrance down on westwood is an entry and exit the reason for that um, was twofold one had to do with the existing directional parking um, in front of the police station but also because we didn't want people turning off of route one onto westwood and having cars queued up to exit off of westwood and not being able to take a left into the site causing a traffic accident at the corner of westwood and route one so we thought it would be intuitive to in instead of even promoting the opportunity to turn left to make sure that people that turn onto westwood go further down away from the um, away from the uh, intersection so as not to cause any backups on route one so, so so in other words you're planning to maintain that diagonal parking as, as correct currently just um but this is roger this is uh, this is tom eric i'm the project traffic engineer i just want to clarify you made I want to make sure that you understand that you can make a left into the site southbound on Route One in that two-way left center, two-way left turn lane. That's that's permitted. So that driveway, our Route One will allow entry only, whether it be left in or right in. And so part of that is related to what you just said. If we can kind of move some of those movements away from Oak Hill, I mean everybody knows the queue backs up create some problems as you get near Fairfield. So the thought is if we can get people to make some movements further south, so lefts in. The, one of the issues with, with allowing exit movements at that location onto Route 1 is that most people don't pay attention to a sign that says no left turn. I mean, that's the movement that is an unsafe movement, quite frankly, you know, on a roadway like this arterial street. And so really the design is cognizant of that. And so if you just you know, it's hard to design a, a driveway without a median in the street to prevent left turn movement. So you end up with this sort of weird situation that quite frankly, you have people that disobey sort of regulations and make that left turn. So it gets, a, that gets a little complicated in terms of thinking about an entry and exit at that location. I, I, I totally understand that. And I know that you can make a uh, turn on that center lane. Um, the problem is, as I, experiences you experience it is that quite often there's a queuing at the intersection that stretches all the way back that would stretch beyond Fairfield Road sure and my only concern is anybody coming heading south wanting to go into this property first they may miss Fairfield Road completely and that do know they want to go down Fairfield they may not be able to get across anyways because of the queuing of the traffic at that intersection. That, that intersection is obviously a very problematic intersection. Um, and if, if you look, if you look related to that issue also, Roger, if you look at the, the aerial map, you can see that the center two-way left turn lane is just beginning at Fairfield. So there really isn't a good space for someone sort of to queue up to turn left on the Fairfield. You're in sort of this weird, you're in that sort of left turn lane that heads to Gorham. So you're in a tough spot. So having some of those left turn movements happen, you know, occur south of there makes makes some sense to me. Well, heading north on Route 1 right there, it's two lanes. And then right at Fairfield, the left turn lane, is it two lanes there? Yeah, there's two lanes there to make a left turn, I think. Or is it one? There's one. There's one. Yeah. The issue, the issue is southbound. Southbound going into the site, you do not have a space to, to turn into the left turn lane, the center two-way left turn lane. If, if, if Sam, go back to the go back to the site plan, Sam. It's easier to see it. Yeah, you, you actually you can see some queuing right there on that overhead. Yeah, you can. But if you look here, you can see where the left turn lane starts after fifth, the center two-way left turn lane, where the two lanes yeah. off of two arrows. You can't. You you need to get past Fairfield to actually get into a space to queue and wait to turn into the site. And so you're better off doing it south of Fairfield than closer to Fairfield, where you, you're closer to not only the queue that you talked about, 
but there isn't a good space for you to sort of wait and make that turn. Yeah, and, and Roger, point well taken. And I think that's why, you know, we have tried to provide some flexibility and options um, entering and, and exiting the site is, is because of that. It's a, it's a tough intersection. So trying to find the balance between reducing the curb cuts, but, you know, also providing a functional site that way. You're not demolishing any of the um, current structures, are you? Okay. Yeah, it's, that is it's, not our intention. Okay, I was I was just wondering if um, any portion of that police station, you know, where you have a little patio and everything, whether that's going to remain or not. Yes, that'll remain. Yeah. Okay. No, I, I mean I I hope hope you make it work because it, it sounds like a pretty interesting uh, concept you have there. Um, the only thing, it, just in passing, I would uh, suggest on uh, that memorial, that's memorial. I don't know if there's a plaque there or anything now. You know if there's a plaque there? I know there's like four stool, wooden uh, stone stools. Does anybody know? I, I can bring up uh, Street View real quick. What, the, the only thing I was going to suggest, most people don't have a clue what that is. Yeah. And I did have Roger, <clears throat> if you don't mind, Mr. Jay jumping in. I, I did have a conversation with <clears throat> Mike Shaw at our public works department. That, that, that little memorial actually went in as part of a gateway grant through the DOT and uh, Mike Shaw and his crew did some sort of dig, digging and due diligence on that. And um, so certainly I think if there's modifications that that could be within the purview of this review if the board sort of sees fit. Um, there's sort of, uh, but to your question about a plaque, I'm not certain of that myself. I've walked by it a number of times, but. Uh, yeah, I don't recall seeing one. And, and, and my only point is um, um, most, I would venture to say the vast majority of people in Scarborough have no, no idea what that represents. <laughs> so it would be nice if there was some sort of a plaque or something there, so at least, um, once it's on the site, it's away from the road and more on the site, people have an idea what, what, what's the what's the signi uh, significance of it, you know? That's We'd awesome. be happy to study that further and, and to commemorate it if that, if that was of interest to the town. You could probably just ask any old timer in town, they'll tell you all about it. <laughs> okay, good luck with it. Thank you. Thanks, Roger. And a board member, uh, uh, Jennifer, go ahead. Um, I also had um, similar questions that Roger raised about um, turning movements in and out of the site. I, you know, I know that you're looking into that, but actually, the um, the situation that he explained, and actually, I think Sam, that you were that you were talking about um, with not wanting a full access driveway close to Route 1 off, off of Westwood for reasons of um, stacking and queuing and potential overflow out onto um, Route 1 mainline. I, I actually had the same exact um, scenario play out in my head, but through the driveway that you're showing, um, the entrance in only off of Route 1. So I just, it kind of looks like, first of all, I think it's a little, um, it seems kind of tight and I think you know if you had two or more cars in there at a decision making point or if you had someone backing out of a space really anywhere near um, that part of the parking area I think you I think you run a, a similar risk particularly during um, you know peak hour times when those queue lengths out of the, the Oak Hill signal are the longest um, on the flip side, can fully appreciate tenants feeling like they might um, be slighted access without that point onto Route 1. So um, that's a good challenge for you guys <laughs> to work on. Um, aside from that, I will say that my, my absolute first takeaway from this um, sketch plan was that I don't, um, I don't know that I've ever seen a site and you're sort of helped 
in this way by having um, side streets on two sides in addition to, to Route 1. But I don't know that I've ever seen some a project come in and address access management so completely. You're uh, just in what you've shown here, you're proposing so many um, reductions in, in curb cuts to both Route 1 and the side streets. And I know that those were there probably, you know, as a functionality of the prior use here, but um, it just feels like you're really sort of paring that down thoughtfully to what this site and your development program needs and nothing um, beyond that. So just, I uh, wanted to make a point of that. I think that's really great because it causes a lot of other problems in other sites that don't do that. Um, uh, other uh, hurrahs for, I just wrote a lot of exclamation points while you were presenting. Um, I think the approach to both shared parking um, and building reuse, I mean, we don't have a lot of like big old wonderful um, buildings in Scarborough and, and you know, again, I understand that in a lot of cases it is easier for a variety of reasons to come in and take that down and put up something that fits a development program more specifically. But, um, you know, you, you, it's obvious that you're not intending to do that. And not only that, but you're, you're trying to find something that's really going to work well with what you have here on the site. And so I just think I'm just so excited to see the mix here of sort of old and new um, residential, commercial, all of that. I, I, I agree with Roger that it's, that it's exciting. And I was always sort of hoping when I joined the planning board that um, however long my tenure here is that I would get to see sort of some, some really cool redevelopment here. And I think you've definitely brought that forth. Um, the only other question that I had or points to consider um, would be left turns out of anywhere. <laughs> um, so I know, again, that's a challenge. These are public streets. There's nothing really that you're probably going to do about Fairfield or Westwood. But, um, you know, also understanding that, again, the prior use of the site had the distinct advantage of um, lights, sirens, and red lights at their leisure to help them get back out onto Route 1 and potentially make um, left turns as needed. And so obviously that's not an option here. I just wonder um, what thoughts you might have in terms of how to get people southbound from this, um, from this project. And if that is, I, I think that sort of comes full circle to maybe, uh, maybe reconsidering the, that second um, driveway onto Westwood as um, two way, because if it is not, and you're encouraging left turns out of Westwood to go southbound, that means someone's making that full loop all the way around, um, all the way around the site. So uh, all things I'm sure that your, um, your team is considering anyway, but um, th those are just a couple of things that jumped out at me. But again, I think um, just really, smart, exciting um, things that you're working on here. So thanks for coming forward with us. Thank you, Jennifer. Thanks, Jennifer. Rachel? Yeah, um, I just want to say that uh, with a great deal of disappointment, uh, that I think the uh, two businesses that got cold feet are making a really big mistake. Um, I think this is an exciting development. Um, Scott, it's something that Scarborough was ready for. Uh, just walking distance around that area, there are a lot of people who would take advantage of whatever is in that site. Um, I, I echo concerns about um, access off of Route 1. I, I have no, no issues per se about keeping a, an entrance on Route 1, but I, I, re, I certainly want to see the, the whole traffic movement I want to take take a look at that because left turns uh, out of that area onto Route One is a problem. Um, you know, if there were a way to cut through to Ward Street, that would take care of all of your problems um, because that would provide a, a signalized intersection. You know, just about a block and a half over, um, but that doesn't exist right now. Uh, I love the whole. 
it, there, there's a there's a holistic approach, I, I guess I would say, in, in that it is a community and it's seen as a community with one building having um, access to another building for an amenity uh, for the community room mm -hmm. uh, and to the um, what we that people should have had put in there, um, you know, for a small grocery area or a, a perhaps a wine bar. Um, but we'd need more traffic. We would need more parking for that. I have a question. Um, in the current, in the old police building, uh, you're showing actually a, a rooftop patio. Um, had had there, there been any sort of a thought that that would be attached to a small restaurant? Uh, and does that building already have um, uh, an elevator to, to handle that sort of uh, facility. I can answer that, Rachel. This is Tim Hebert. Um, the intention of the rooftop patio was actually uh, relevant to one of your earlier comments on a previous uh, planning board agenda meeting tonight, um, you know, with respect to breakaway outdoor space for office building tenants and being able to have outdoor meetings or spaces of the like. Um, we're also, I was also considering doing a rooftop garden uh, and having growing vegetables on there at one point um, to support kind of local, that, that local feel that, that may have been or may still be part of the fire station. Um, also want to make note that, uh, you know, all of that is subject to what, you know, may or may not be. We hope that this, that this, uh, that the various buildings on this site, new and old, have a solar component to them. Um, so we're hoping to build some sustainability into the project as well. So all of those things, community sustainability, walkability um, are, are part of our goals for this project. And, um, and we're, as a result of, as a result of uh, taking this difficult approach to making something meaningful, you know, it's, it's hard to, uh, during in this crazy time we're in to, um, to be able to achieve these goals very quickly as quick as we hoped them to be. So we're, we're staying steadfast with our goals for the project and we're hopeful that we're gonna be, uh, find somebody and, and that uh, it will all come together as we envision. Well, it's, um, it's a wonderful vision and I, I really enjoyed the way you explained it and, and talked about it and presented it. I think um, uh, I could see, I, I could really feel what you were talking about. Um, you went past the dry, we have X number of parking spaces um, and uh, into what it means to, for people to live there or to, to work there or shop there. Um, I think I had, uh, let's see, I probably had one more question. I'm trying to think what it is now. Um, and oh, that's uh, the uh, the park, the Betts Diner. I have no idea what that is. So anything that kind of explains that uh, would be helpful. I'm if you do have to move the entrance on Route One, if that's where one of the entrances ends up, and you have to shift it south, um, I think it would be difficult to move the diner, the the uh, the park from where you've currently got it because uh, the the park where it is between the proposed uh, savings bank and the, the fire station actually functions both as as a park remembrance uh, and as an open space for people to gather. So um, it connects those two buildings. So I, I think uh, that's a good place for it, whether you have a an entrance right there or the entrance is, is further south. Uh, I I really like what you're doing. Um, I think your biggest challenge really is going to be the traffic and the left turn. Um, you've thought through a lot of the interior uh, traffic flow. Uh, you just simply have a difficult site and I have every confidence you're going to be able to handle it. So I appreciate this and uh, I like what you're doing. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Rachel. Roger. Yes, I just had a quick comment um, or question. 
path entrance entrance only on Route One. Should we um, keep that open um, for further discussion until we know about what's going to be actually proposed? You know, in the in the in the old fire station, and and get a formal traffic analysis because maybe that might be the most viable way to get in and out of this property. In other words, I, I'm saying not close the door on that possibility at this point. It's not about making it wider or leaving the existing large curb cut the way it is. No, not the whole curb cut, but just making it so you can go in and out. Not, in other words, take advantage of, of the turn lane there. Um, Cause it might we'll certainly look at that. Yeah. I mean, it, I'm, I'm just saying we, I don't, I'm not sure we should necessarily just rule it out as, as a viable option. Take well, certainly, Roger. Pardon me? Yeah. yeah, I was just going to say certainly where this is sketch plan. I think, you know, nothing is ruled out or in at this time. So it's really about identifying areas of further exploration or issues really to think through. Um, so I, I think that's a good point that nothing is, again, this is a non non binding um, discussion with the board, uh, really just again that opportunity to talk about where issues may may lie in the future. Yeah, I, I just I wanted to uh, mention two things um, uh, off of comments that were made. Um, Jennifer brought it up with regards to cars turning out we say we're calling it self. Uh, but it's, uh, it, we'll just say southbound plan orientation onto route one. Um, and also about traffic movement within the site and the surrounding neighborhood. So uh, we had uh, had uh, been part of kind of a neighborhood meeting back in <laughs> February, I think it was now, um, with residents, uh, abutter, abutters and residents in the, in the neighborhood and heard them loud and clear that, um, you know, currently there's traffic that traverses through the neighborhood. Um, to for simplicity or whatever uh and so a, a go, another goal of our project here is to um provide traffic flow within our site and no further into the neighborhood um to be able to you know minimize or reduce um be intentional about the direction of traffic within the site to get them onto and off of route one without having to go through the neighborhoods um so that was very intentional um we've spent many iterations of this site plan, looking at one-way traffic around the site, two-way traffic here and there. Um, and this is where we are today, um, which which we feel very good about uh, right now. Um, but hear you guys loud and clear about the entrance on Route 1. Obviously, our, our thoughts are that we would improve traffic circulation and, and um, um, exit onto Route 1 um, via signage. Uh, and as Tom mentioned, signage is only as good as the people that read it. Um, but I think where this is kind of a neighborhood style type uh, building and atmosphere, um, when you come to this site, you will come here more than once and it'll become intuitive that you have to get onto Westwood in order to take a left onto Route 1. Thanks. Um. Yeah, for my two cents, you know, I, I think, you know, I, as you have a challenge here with traffic circulation, I think uh, signage, internal signage is going to be important to how you push traffic in and out. Um, you, know, you might want to look at, you know, putting your southbound traffic out onto um, to Westwood, and then your northbound onto Fairfield, just some sort of uh, combination of the two, but we'll leave that to you and what, what you need to do on that side, but uh, other than that, are there any other planning board comments that they should be considering or taking away with them as they go forward? Rachel? Yeah, I just want to say, uh, um, reinforce the idea of shared parking. I think that's the way to go. Uh, so to continue to, in, to investigate that. Thank you. Thank you. One, one last. Um, thing I forgot to mention earlier to reiterating a comment from staff just about strengthening um, or, or completing, I guess, a connection off of that Route 1 sidewalk on um, into your site. So it looks like you kind of have that teed up in a couple of places. But um, I think, uh, you know, sidewalk links to the front buildings would be of value, as would 
um, to a certain extent, walkways and sidewalks out to both Fairfield and Westwood, recognizing there aren't necessarily dedicated pedestrian facilities on those streets, but that um, if your intent is to, to serve those neighboring streets um, and residences in a walkable way, certainly meeting them um, at the edge of the road is a good way to do that. Thanks, Jennifer. All right. With that, um, I guess we'll uh, let you go. I think you have an feedback, Jamela or Chase or Angela. Uh, Jay, do you, or Angela, do you need anything further uh, for clarification that might help them for their next steps? Okay, I see some nodding heads. So, all right, thank you, gentlemen. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Next item on our agenda this evening is MRW Development LLC requests a final site and subdivision plan review for lot six with an inch into Sessor's Matthew 53, lot six. Mel. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so as a reminder, uh, this applicant's proposing uh, a project that consists of approximately uh, 18,000 square foot warehouse and garage building and a 7,700 square foot mixed use two-story building consisting of uh, light industrial space and garage space on the first floor and eight apartment units on the second floor, uh, all within lot six of the Innovation District subdivision at the end of Dynamic Drive. Um, so back in September, the board did grant preliminary uh, approval uh, since it does require subdivision approval uh, back in September. And really the only remaining comment is uh, that um, as previously noted, staff from Maine DEP did indicate that they are requiring an amendment to the Innovation District's stormwater permit, uh, given that the impervious area for this project is over the uh, approved threshold. So the applicants actually indicating, uh, are actually requesting uh, final approval for the project with a condition um, that phase two of the project cannot move forward to construction until they receive the required approval from Maine DEP. So just wanted the board to uh, think about that request and provide feedback. Um, and if you're comfortable with that request, uh, staff has provided a draft motion for your consideration. Turn it back to you. Thanks, Jamel. Mr. Bacon. Um, Our next actually, <laughs> Ms. Clair, thanks. I'm here to answer questions. Jamel, can you allow me to share? You should be able to share, Nancy. Um, you're not able to? No. At the bottom of the screen, I can yes. pull yours up again. Can, I'm happy to, uh, to run the pointer if you'd like me to. That sounds good. I was going to use slide two, Dan. I think that's the easiest one. What shall I? Uh, can everyone see the screen? I can see it. Great. So um, Jamel did a great job of uh, introducing the project. We don't have much of a presentation for you. Uh, in addition to what Jamel has already gone over, uh, this project was approved at a preliminary level uh, back on September 14th. And we're here tonight. There's been no changes to the design of the site other than addressing any staff comments that had been outstanding. Um, so the, the site is as you had seen at the last uh, meeting, which was uh, reviewed, we have added a phase line. Um, and as Jamel noted, we are looking at um, an approval which would allow the construction of building B to move forward once the DEP approval is received to go over the 80% lot coverage. Um, uh, Gold Palmer has put together a, an application package for that. It's expected to go in this week. It's considered a minor revision at the DEP level. There are no physical improvements that are proposed uh, as part of that plan. It's just simply uh, looking at what excess capacity is already available uh, in uh, Wet Pond 1 to accommodate additional impervious cover uh, within this portion of the Innovation District. So we fall well within that. Um, but are looking to have an approval so that building A, the larger building on the site, which is the sister building to the building on lot seven, which was recently approved by you folks, 
that those two could move forward to construction. And then once the DEP is approval, approval is received, building B could then move forward as well. So that's the end of our presentation. Thank you very much. We have opportunity for public comment on this item tonight. If there's anyone here in the public that wish to comment, please use the raise my hand feature in the bottom right hand corner of your Zoom app. All right, seeing none, I will we'll turn this over to the planning board and looking for opinions from the board of whether or not uh, we are comfortable with the approach here being presented, which is uh, phase one uh, proceeding and then and phase two once they have the uh, the permit in hand. Uh, um, Jennifer, you have any thoughts on that? Uh, just curious if they, if the applicant has a sense for the time frame for which they will get that um, DEP approval. Um, we're, yeah, we're anticipating it's going to be, you know, probably. Um, a month or two review. Uh, it's a minor revision. It's not likely to be a, an amendment to the stormwater site law. So it's a shorter review time period. Um, and it's, as Nancy indicated, building A is really kind of the, the priority, um, given that's the same exact building program as lot seven and the sites are integrated um, and we like them to track on the same schedule building B is a different program different architecture and can be phased later without um, you know easily with the project thanks all right any other board members with questions Roger yeah, I just want to say it seems pretty reasonable to me, so I have no problem with this at all. All right, thank you. All right, Angela, do you have uh, something for us to review here? Yes. Thank you. I move to approve the subdivision and site plan project titled Lot 6 Innovation District as depicted on the plan set prepared by St. Clair Associates dated 9-21-20 with the following findings, waivers, and conditions. The applicant is proposing the construction of approximately 18,000 square foot building consisting of warehouse, light industrial space, and approximately 7,696 square foot mixed use two-story building consisting of warehouse and light industrial space on the first floor and eight apartment units on the second floor. Project is located at the end of Dynamic Drive, a private access drive on lot six of the Innovation District subdivision and is within the Crossroads Plan Development CPD Zone District. Planning Board has reviewed the application and supporting documentation and finds the proposed design of the site plan adequately addresses the subdivision site plan review, zoning ordinance, and the Innovation District regulating plan requirements for the site utilization and layout, access, internal vehicular movement, parking, pedestrian ways, landscaping, stormwater management, lighting, architecture, signage, utilities, and storage. Waivers, one, permit the proposed driveway width of 24 feet to the south of building A and 22 feet to the south of building B. Two, permit the proposed driveway separation of 68 feet. Three, permit the proposed parking aisle width of 24 feet. Conditions, one, phase two of the project as depicted on the site plan should not be constructed until the applicant receives a required approval from Maine DEP to authorize impervious cover in excess of the permitted 80%. Two, prior to of a building permit, the applicant shall revise the plan set to include A, a, additional screening provisions adjacent to the proposed transformer pads on the site. B, underground utilities along Dynamic Drive as approved by the Planning Board. This shall be reviewed and approved by the Planning Department. Three, prior to the issuance of a building permit, the applicant shall A, pay the traffic impact fees. B, pay the re recreation contribution fees. Four, prior to the issuance of a sign permit, the applicant shall provide a final signage plan. This shall be reviewed and approved by the Planning Department. Five, prior to the start of construction, a pre-construction meeting is required. Meeting shall include appropriate town staff, the developer and their site contractor and is to be coordinated through the planning department. Prior to the issuance of a certificate of, cert certificate of occupancy, a copy of the modified main DOT traffic movement permit shall be submitted to the planning department. That is the motion. Do I have a second? Second. Is there a second on that? I'm sorry. I don't know if I missed it. 
Second. <laughs> Second. Roger. Thank you. Any discussion by the board? Okay. All in favor, Roger Bealey? Yes. Jennifer Ladd? Yes. Richard DePerry? Yes. Rachel Hendrickson? Yes. Nick McGee? Yes. Make sure that is unanimous. Thank you and good luck. Thank you Thank very, you very much. much. Next item on tonight's agenda is Coach Next Seawall and Dune Restoration LLC request a shoreland zoning review for the replacement of an existing seawall and dune restoration project at Sub Road Beach, Specialist Matthew 17, Lots 17, 13, 38, 47, 55, and 58, and Matthew 18, Lots 4, 8, and 10. Jamel. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so the applicants before the board tonight uh, for the review. Uh, the replacement of the existing seawall structure um, and nourishment of the existing dune along Scarborough Beach under the Shoreland Zoning Ordinance. The applicants proposing to construct a new seawall on the same alignment as the existing wall uh, and import sand and a planted worm windward of the wall. So staff has recommended that the applicant uh, discuss the proposal in detail and how the project will meet the relevant shoreland zoning standards as noted in the staff review comments. And the applicant should also discuss the erosion and sediment control measures that will be utilized uh, during the construction phase. And staff did uh, draft a motion uh, this evening uh, for the board's consideration. I'll turn it back to you. Thanks, Jamel. And for the applicant, uh, who will be speaking this evening? Uh, good evening, my name is Barney Baker. I'm a civil engineer and uh, representing the Protsnick Seawall and Dune Restoration LLC. Uh, can everybody hear me okay? Good, um, I'm just gonna share my screen. I've got a, uh, a short presentation to uh, give you and hope to um, give you a, a understanding of the project. So um, I believe I am sharing my screen at this point and uh, just getting the slideshow started. Can people see the first slide? Okay, great. So um, uh, this uh, is a picture of the seawalls that exist out now on the Eastern shore of Protsnick. Um, I'm representing the Protsnick LLC and that is um, a total of nine contiguous shorefront properties um, with a combined total of uh, 1,150 linear feet of wall. Um, several folks on our team are mentioned here. Um, this is the location of the project. You can see um, the uh, Protsnack is here. Uh, the wall, existing seawall structures are right here. Um, and uh, again, in this view, you can see the red area is where these walls are located. Um, and in this aerial, aerial view, you can see the wall extends from uh, Masker Lane all the way down Garrison, Sakurapa, Smithers, almost to Harmon Street. And uh, again, contiguous seawall, all existing structures. And so why are we replacing them? Well, they're in really poor condition. They're of different ages. Um, they're a timber seawall. I think everybody's walked along the uh, Eastern beach here. And uh, these slides show uh, how, what condition they're in. Um, they're not supposed to um, have this much deflection in them. Uh, they're just very old and very tired. Uh, and this is uh, what happens uh, when uh, they aren't maintained. Um, this happened just two years ago to uh, two of the properties uh, that we're actually replacing now. That one was replaced, um, but we're going to replace it with a more resilient system. So here are the nine properties, um, starting with uh, Riley, Kohlberg, Bell, Sakurapa, Munson, Bartol, 
Angel, Black Point, and Smith. And uh, it's quite a feat to get all these people together to um, work together to replace their wall. And uh, the reason they did that is because uh, collectively um, they were able to uh, speak to DEP and get some uh, concessions for a new uh, design that allowed them to put the wall in at a uniform height. Um, it allowed them to uh, get the construction all done at the same time and uh, generally uh, move forward with a, a, a better project. Um, we're really looking at two separate activities. One is replacing the existing seawall. That would be allowed um, without uh, planning board approval. That would just be a, a replacement of an existing structure that staff could approve. The, the piece that's, uh, uh, excuse me, piece that's uh, creating um, the reason that we're uh, with the planning board tonight is the dune nourishment portion. And I'll explain what that is. Uh, so this is a cross section of the, of the seawall replacement. Um, the ocean is uh, this side and uh, here's the beach. Um, so we're putting in a more robust seawall system. It's gonna look exactly the same as the one that's there now. It's gonna be timber faced, but it's gonna have a uh, composite sheet piling behind it. And that sheet piling is, is tied back to a dead man. Uh, these are 20 foot uh, sheet piles. So it's, it's a much stronger, much more resilient system that's there, but it's gonna look exactly the same. Then DEP and Main Geological Survey, um, their input into the project is they've asked us to put in this dune nourishment. And what is that? That's just an additional height of sand and uh, dune grass plantings that sort of stands up from the existing uh, elevation that's out there. So you can see this is the height of the seawall. That's for all intents and purposes not changing, although there are some seawalls are getting a little higher because we're putting everything back at a uniform height for all nine properties. So um, it's the area behind the seawall that we're adding fill to. And uh, we've indicated uh, on the plans how much fill that is. It varies per property because each property has got um, a different uh, uh, area behind the seawall. Um, a different elevation there. So this is this is the uh, dune nourishment here. It's, uh, it's essentially sand and uh, dune grass um, that is uh, uh, planted in the sand. And this dune grass is is very resilient. These walls um, will still get overtopped. Um, there's a we could not put them up. Um, to the point where they, they would not be over top, over top that uh, DEP wouldn't allow us to do that. Um, but the, the dune grass um, adds some additional uh, flood protection. So the design summary for the whole system is to reduce the cycle of storm damage and seawall replacement. The existing walls out there um, last uh, anywhere from 10 to 15 years. The wall that we're replacing is going to last uh, significantly longer than that um, because it's got a composite sheet pile um, backing. Um, we're going to respond to climate change. Everybody knows that uh, the sea levels are rising um, and uh, we're getting more frequent storm activity, so we need a stronger seawall. Um, we're going to replace the existing seawalls with a more resilient system of uniform height. Uh, so that goes. That's one of the advantages of clubbing together with your neighbors. All nine properties will have the same seawall height now. There will be no change in beach access. Uh, the beach access um, currently uh, has steps from each property that goes down to the beach. That's not gonna change. And there's no change in seawall appearance. That beach access, by the way, is, is a seasonal. Um, it, uh, there are stairs are only put there in the summer. So where have we been? We've got our DEP approval, um, which, you know, quite frankly, took over a year to get um, because it was very carefully re reviewed by Maine Geological Survey, Inland Fisheries and Wildlife, Marine Resources, Maine Historic Preservation, 
and the project's also been reviewed by Army Corps of Engineers. So town of Scarborough is, is our last stop. So what were the staff review comments? Um, staff recommends that the applicant be prepared to discuss the proposal in detail and how the project will meet the standards noted um, with the board. What I've done, um, it may or may not be appropriate. I've actually repeated the standards and repeated our, our response to them. Uh, the planning board members each have this, um, but I can just go through them very quickly. Um, we'll maintain self, safe and healthful conditions. Uh, this is a restoration project that replaces an existing seawall and provides dune nourishment and plantings to maintain and improve coastal resilience for the nine contiguous properties. Basically, we're maintaining the conditions that exist now. We're just doing that with a, a better seawall. Will not result in water pollution, erosion, or sedimentation to surface waters. Um, we're really not changing a thing. We're adding, um, replacing the seawall and we're adding dune nourishment. And the purpose of that nourishment is to um, feed the beach. It's actually intended uh, to um, be transported over time by wind or by wave overtopping. It's intended to, to be transported to the, to the beach. It's part of the, the sand system. We'll provide will adequately provide for disposal of all wastewater. There is no wastewater associated with the project. Um, will not have an adverse impact on spawning grounds, fish, aquatic life, bird or other wildlife habitat. Um, we do have our DEP permit and uh, they've, they've uh, determined that the project meets this standard. Um, will conserve shore cover and visual as well as actual points of access to inland and coastal waters. Um, nothing is changing uh, with this project. All we're doing is replacing the existing seawall. We'll protect archeological historical resources as de designated in the comprehensive plan. Again, we're not changing a thing. We, we did um, communicate with the uh, main historic preservation and the tribal nations as required by our permit. Will not adversely affect existing commercial fishing or mar maritime activities. There's no commercial fishing associated with the project. We'll avoid problems associated with floodplain development and use. Um, we have provided a separate flood hazard development permit uh, to the town, uh, to your uh, code enforcement officer. It shows there are no adverse flood impacts associated with this project. And the land use standards, um, all new construction and development shall be designed to ensure stormwater runoff from the site is less than or equal to that of the natural pre-development condition. Again, we're not changing anything. Um, we're adding dune nourishment, but that's a sacrificial um, addition and uh, it's not going to impact the, the um, stormwater uh, behavior. So that uh, um, item number two, stormwater runoff control systems shall be monitored as necessary to ensure proper functioning. Um, there are no uh, stormwater uh, structures associated with this project. Uh, sand is a very porous material. Any um, runoff onto that sand um, infiltrates into the ground and uh, is uh, dissipated naturally uh, through the seawall. Um, the applicant should be prepared to discuss the erosion and sedimentation control measures that will be utilized during the construction phase of the project. Um, we do have uh, erosion con control, notes, control notes in the plan and the um, uh, contractor is required to be certified as a, as a coastal um, contractor with DEP. Um, we've met with uh, the uh, Scarborough, the, the Proudsneck uh, Road Commissioner. Uh, we've met with town staff. Um, we've uh, enlisted the uh, We've presented the project to all the neighbors and, and have actually presented the planning board with um, a multitude of, of uh, letters in support of the project from, from the neighbors uh, that uh, served to benefit by the coastal protection. Um, it's a sand, it's a replacement of an existing seawall. So um, we do put conventional erosion control fence around it on the landward side. On the seaward side, 
the new wall is uh, for the most part, um, not entirely, but for the most part built behind the existing seawall. There are a couple of places where the alignment of the uh, new seawall is still behind, but it, it will impact the existing seawall. And in that case, um, the existing seawall will provide the erosion protection uh, between the project and the beach, um, except in those few cases where uh, the contractor will be required to place additional um, temporary sheet piling to protect the, uh, protect the beach and infiltration from sediment. Um, final uh, one uh, peer review comment that we have from Woodard and Kern that has not yet been addressed. Um, and there's some confusion here is the temporary seawall, the temporary access to the beach or the seasonal access to the beach um, will be maintained. Uh, there are currently 11 uh, timber steps that are placed each season on the seawall um, onto the beach. Uh, those will be removed during construction um, if they're in the way. Uh, typically at this time of year, they're already taken out. Um, and they will be replaced in their, in their same location. They provide access, there are 11 of them, they pro provide access for the nine property owners and for two uh, right of way um, uh, entry uh, points uh, that cross the, uh, the seawall to get to the beach. So with that, I'm uh, available for questions. I would also point out that there are several members of the, the Proudsneck LLC um, also in attendance and, and also other design team members. Thank you very much. Uh, we do have an opportunity for public comment on this item. So if you are here to uh, provide comment, please use the raise my hand feature in the lower right hand corner of your Zoom app. All right, seeing none, I'm gonna open this up to the board. Uh, just in general, uh, any board questions or comments Rachel. Yeah, um, in terms of the uh, the dunes and back of the seawall, is there going to be some sort of a, uh, a formal maintenance plan? Uh, in other words, let's say the sea overtops and it manages to scrape out a ditch in back of the, in between the wall and the rest of the dune. Do um, you have plans for how you're going to uh, maintain that, that system? Uh, th that's a great question. Uh, as part of the DEP uh, permit, um, there is a, uh, a requirement for the uh, property owners to um, survey the project when it's finished uh, to uh, uh, and provide a, a plan that shows that they they put in the correct amount of dune nourishment. And then after um, uh, another period of time, they're required to survey it again. So they will be uh, maintaining uh, the uh, both the dune grass and the dune. And uh, um, I know there are members here tonight, but uh, they have formed an LLC uh, to uh, both build the wall and to uh, maintain it uh, down the road. Thank you. That's, um, that's very forward thinking. And uh, the the sort of thing that uh, we need as we're looking at uh, some of the, the climate changes. I'm on the Conservation Commission, so I take note of such things. I appreciate the work you're doing. Uh, and uh, this looks like a, a good project. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Rachel. Any other members with any thoughts or comments on this? Questions? Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll I think this is a, a great project. I like the organization and appreciate the time and effort you've definitely put into uh, making this happen. So uh, with that, I think we have a motion ready, Ms. Blanchett. I move to approve the seawall alignment and dune nourishment project titled Prout's Next Seawall Alignment prepared by Baker Design Consultants dated 8-6-20 with the following findings and conditions. Find as proposing to construct a new seawall on the same alignment as the existing wall and import sand into a planted berm landward of the wall. 
properties located along the Scarborough Beach and includes properties located on assessment map U17, lots 1730, 30A, 47, 55, and 58, and map U18, lots 4, 8, and 10. Properties located within the residential 2R2 zoning district. Planning board has reviewed the application and supporting documentation and finds the proposed design of the site plan adequately addresses the shoreland zoning ordinance standards. Conditions, one, prior to issuance of a building permit, the applicant shall revise the plan set to include addresses. The staff review include plan sets to in address the staff comments in the memorandum dated 10-26-20 and the civil peer review comments in the memorandum from Woodard and Curran dated 10-22-20. This shall be reviewed and approved by the planning department. Two, prior to the start of construction, a pre-construction is required. Meaning shall include appropriate town staff, the developer, and their site contractor, and is to be coordinated through planning department. Is there any more below that, uh, Angela? I'm sorry. <laughs> nope. Nope. Okay. Thank you. That's the motion. Do I have a second? Second. I have a second. Any board discussion? All right. I'll call the roll. Rachel Hendrickson. Yes. Jennifer Ladd. Yes. Rick Duperry. Yeah. And I'm missing one. Roger. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Rick McGee, yes. They assure that is unanimous. Thank you and good luck to you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next item is item number 11 that has been tabled at the Apps West. So we are on to item number 12. The planning board will conduct a public hearing to receive comment on the proposed amendments to chapter 405 of the zoning ordinance to amend sections 18-B, Huggies Parkway, HP zone. Okay. Uh, yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> this item is actually being brought to you. This is a property initiated zoning amendment request um, that has been to council through a first reading. Um, and the applicant, as you noted, is seeking to amend the Highest Parkway District um, by adding um, the potential for drive-through restaurants. Um, however, those drive-through restaurants are being proposed as only being available um, really as either as both part of a plan development and as part of a mixed use building. Um, I think the idea there is to sort of try to control some of the potential proliferation of, um, of drive-throughs along Haggis Parkway. I, I, this item was before the Long Range Planning Committee uh, and received some comments there, which I believe you have a copy of in your packet. Um, one of the questions at the Lang <clears throat> Long Range Planning Committee was around the concerns of, or the potential for uh, traffic impacts through drive-through restaurants. And so we had our peer review uh, traffic engineer take a very high level sort of look, a 30,000 uh, foot look, if you will. Um, and so you have those comments uh, in the packet as well. Um, I will just note that at council first reading, I think council also had shared some concerns about potential for proliferation. I think they appreciated the initial discussion around requiring uh, drive-throughs as part of either, as part of both a plan development and a mixed use building. But I think there was also some other concerns expressed by the board or by council, I should say, um, that that wouldn't necessarily inhibit the potential for there being a number of drive-throughs along the Haggis Parkway. And maybe there'd be opportunities to look at some other additional provisions, be that uh, separation distance requirements, uh, or location to intersections or something to that um, um, along those lines. So I just wanna offer that to the planning board as you go through the, the discussion and, and what your thoughts might be if, if you share those similar concerns. And, and if so, then staff can certainly work with the applicant um, and council moving forward on thinking about alternative language or additional language, I should say. So. Uh, with that, I turn it back to you, um, and I see the applicant is here as well. Thanks, Jay. Um, all right, and the applicant this evening. Uh, <laughs> Are you ready? Yes. Okay, I couldn't. Some, someone had sneezed. I couldn't. I couldn't hear you. Uh, good evening. My name is Andy Sturgeon from Hoyle Tanner. I'm here representing 
commercial properties that it was Dan Catlin and Richard McGoldrick. They're here too tonight. Um, I think they're on the panel right now. When we first looked at this property, um, and it's a piece on this, it's up on your screen there with a conceptual building. Uh, we realized that banks, uh, drive-through banks were allowed, but we soon found out that drive-through restaurants weren't allowed. And we understood because I think your goal there was not to have a standalone drive-through restaurant up and down Hagus Parkway. But if the restaurant was part of a multi-use building, as we're showing here, where you've got a bank, maybe a coffee shop, maybe, but drive-through, um, and you've got other um, uses in the building, then it might make better sense to allow a restaurant to have drive-through. And as it turns out with COVID, that's an advantage today too, um, one that we certainly didn't plan on. Um, we have an existing curb cut there that you see coming out of the, the golf and ski shop going north to the Hagus Parkway. And uh, we, in, in our proposal, we wouldn't uh, be proposing any further cur curb cuts. But our amendment is not just for this lot, it's for the zone. And the amendment is simply a statement to say that restaurants with drive through service in a mixed use building will be allowed. So that's the only amendment to the zoning that we're asking. Nothing further. We know that eventually we'll be in for a site plan. And at that time, we'll address traffic in more detail. But the Long Range Planning Commission Committee was, was certainly um, concerned about traffic. So they asked the, the city to ask the town to look into it a little more. And they hired uh, Malone and McBroom to do a, a quick analysis. And they wrote a single page letter um, that I think should be in your package. If it isn't, it should be. But it actually states that these roads are de designed for high volume traffic, and which is probably adequate for today. Of course, we'll be going through a traffic movement permit, but adequate today. But you know, if, if up and down the whole Hagus Parkway continues to develop, then there could be more improvements needed in later years. So our request is pretty simple right now in, in looking at that one statement. Uh, amendment to the existing Hagus Parkway zone. And we're all here available for questions should you have any. Thank you very much. Uh, Jay, I'm gonna ask, sorry. Um, I, yeah, I'm gonna ask my question real quick before opening up for public comment. Do you have any, um, and this might be a tall ask, do you have any background as to um, why number seven with which, which says restaurant no drive up drive through or drive drive in service. So, do you have any historical knowledge as to the reasoning why that was being included by whoever formulated the Hagus Parkway district back in the day? Was there were there other concerns that were brought up or some some sort of historical record we could reference for information on it? Yeah, I, I can speak a little bit to it. I guess I'd have to look exactly when the original restaurant language was added. But I think going back, sort of way back in time, when the original Hygis Parkway was constructed and, and the area zoned, it was envisioned to be really a professional office um, uh, parkway, um, you know, uh, business headquarters, if you will. I, I I've heard story of TD Bank's headquarters was sort of originally envisioned to be one of the initial uh, businesses to go there. And then I think as many of board members and certainly residents of Scarborough know for many years, Haggis Parkway sort of stood as an undeveloped area of land. And over time, there's been subsequent uh, modernization or um, adjustments to the to the zone to enable um, additional development. Um, you know, we saw recently the, the contract zone, which allowed the beacon, <clears throat> excuse me, development with the uh, multifamily to go forward. Um, we've seen a couple of the, the um, uh, personal services, the, the climbing gym and the fitness center that have gone in. Um, and I think so, you know, again, originally the, the intent was really around the professional office area, and I would envision that the original sort of assignment of restaurants was really to accommodate more of those type of folks than perhaps um, folks who might be using Haggis Parkway to make a connection from 42 uh, uh, down to uh, Route 1 or, or wherever they may be going. Um, so. 
Thanks for that. Uh, so this is a, a public hearing, so we have an opportunity for a public comment on this item. If you're here in attendance and would like to speak on the issue, please use the raise my hand feature <laughs> in the right hand corner of your app. All right, seeing none, I will turn this over to the board for comments. Roger, do you want to start? Sure. Um, I was reading over the um, Malone and McBroom um, report, and I thought they made a good point when they basically stated that this traffic's going to be basically utilizing the parkway already, and uh, a lot of this will be passed through trips. Um, so I, I think this is, um, this makes some sense to me. Um, I would just um, piggyback what, what Jay was saying. Um, this park, when it was originally, the whole parkway, when it was originally designed, I, I, I remember it very clearly. It was gonna be like a South Borough, only an expanded version of South Borough over in South Portland. Um, you know, with, with a lot of professional buildings and things like that. Um, so I, I think this today with the, with the um, you know, the, uh, the virus and the issues we have today, it makes sense to have some uh, drive through capability if you're gonna be having a restaurant. So I would, I would agree with this. Thanks Roger. Jennifer? Um, I, I, I have a couple questions. The first one is sort of just clarifying in nature, I guess, when, and this sounds like a dumb question to bail on. Um, what do we mean when we talk about mixed use? So having um, a restaurant in a mixed use building, what does that mean? So yeah, the way, that would be basically a multi-tenant building. Okay, so yeah. any other use besides another restaurant? Yep. As allowed in the zone? Right, right. It'd have to be another permitted use, that is correct, yes. Okay. So there's a couple things that um, caught my attention on this. The first was um, also included in the Malonic Broom memo, which referred to um, drive through restaurants as typically fast food and typically pass by traffic. And after I read that, the first things that came to mind were, I don't know if any of you have been recently on say a weekend morning to the drive through at Holy Donut, but that is not, I don't, I, I think it's a, it's a tough sell to consider that as pass by traffic um, or, or fast food in the traditional sense, meaning something that likely has a bunch of other locations. So if you went to McDonald's, for example, in Scarborough and the drive through was too long, but you really wanted to go to McDonald's, you have another, you, you know, usually would have other options without going too terribly far away versus, you know, we have some of these, um, restaurants now that are not necessarily pass bys but they're destinations in and of themselves um i think holy donut is a good example of one that's been really successful in doing that pre-covid and then certainly um you know if you lived halfway between here and portland and you really wanted a holy donut and your options are to get in your car and go sit in the drive through or to stand in a socially distance line on Exchange Street, um, you know, th those are the options, I guess. Um, and the other thing was that the zone, let me just pull up the zoning map here. So, um, so the zone, the, I guess, parkway zone includes a number of properties that appear to me to be accessed from places other than Haggis Parkway. There's a handful of small ones on Payne Road. Do I have that right? And then um, 
a larger one and doesn't show up on this map, I'm guessing that's connected into um, the gallery or sorry, Gateway Boulevard. A little tricky to read. Um, and the only reason I bring that up is because of other um, just drive through observations that I've made from from other restaurants that we have in town that you know it's almost always coffee I feel like and almost always a.m. peak hour and drive through lines spill out over onto whatever um, primary road they're off of. Citing any of these um, projects like this sort of tucked in and off of Haigas Parkway I, I guess I don't I don't have too much concern about that. I think I saw somewhere on your graphic that you are, you this particular site was was planning on 11, um, you know, queue space of 11 vehicles. Um, but if you if this zone were to apply to any of those much smaller sites out on Payne Road and a Dunkin' Donuts wanted to go in next door to a, you know, whatever other mixed use they want to be with. Um, I would certainly have concern about drive-through queues backing out, um, backing out onto that road. And so I, you know, to that end, I appreciated the reading through the long range planning committee's conversation, I guess, about where do we draw the line on um, a traffic issue being pertinent to an individual site versus the zone itself um, you know and certainly every site is different some are some of these are very large properties and some of them are very small and so your traffic issues will be relative just based on that alone um, but I just wanted to make that point because in terms of talking about this as an overall zoning change versus just a site um, a site measure um, I that that was just something that that caught my attention. And then lastly, and you know, um, no, we don't know. We don't know what's going on. Everything now is so weird. <laughs> if a year ago, any one of us had been saying that, you know, you're going to be sitting in the parking lot under a tent at Romeo, the, someone would just think you were crazy. Um, but drive throughs as was noted, by the applicant here is, you know, something that I think is really setting apart certain some businesses as a way to navigate both this current situation, but also, you know, um, who knows what we're in for afterwards. And so I would just kind of challenge the concept that that a, a drive through would necessarily be tied to what we think of as kind of traditional fast food. Um, I noticed today actually there's a little, a very small bagel shop in Portland on Forest Avenue that was always, always they don't have off-site parking, it's on-site parking, they're very popular, it's always busy and you, um, you know, previously you just walked into their doors and it was counter service. They've retrofitted one of their front um, plate glass windows to be a walk up takeout window. And so that's, um, you know, I think we should expect to see kind of this creative, um, just a creative delivery of this type of, um, you know, food service and, and restaurants as we move forward um, as just another way of getting, staying in business really. <laughs> Um, particularly in an area like Scarborough, where we do tend to have a lot of vehicle traffic for places like this. So um, those are just some of the thoughts that crossed my mind. The, you know, the, the parcel as presented that's um, for which this is spawning the conversation, I think in that case, um, it does make some sense, but I would just want to make sure, I guess, that we look at how and where some other parts of this zone may be just a little bit different and whether or not it's appropriate everywhere or what type and if not what do we have what can we do or write in that might um, help address some of that preemptively. And could I just explore that question a little bit with you uh, Nick is that okay? Go ahead, yeah go ahead Jay. 
Yep. So, so what I heard in, in your comments there was a concern about, you know, the plan development process might be a good way to approach some of this, but um, looking at some of these smaller lots that could, if they're, if they're a certain size, there may just be not the, the space to be able capacity. Um, and some folks may try to, you know, who knows what we might see in the future and it might put just a difficult position that we don't need to get into. So I guess what I was hearing is really some concern about particularly the smaller lots along Payne Road. I think for the most part, the lots along Haggis Parkway currently could always be divided later are a bit larger, but so thinking maybe about a, a minimum lot size potentially is, um, and I guess the other thing um, just as we have the conversation, if board members might want to just reflect upon what the council had sort of talked about at first reading about thoughts about, you know, separation. Um, again, the lots along Haggis Parkway right now are fairly large. Um, those are the lots along Haggis Parkway. As you pointed out, Long Payne Road, there are some smaller ones. Um, but, um, you know, is separation something to be thinking about as well? Um, so. I see you nodding your head in terms of lot size. So we can yeah. certainly put some thought to that moving forward. <clears throat> yeah, I think that makes sense. And, you know, again, that's a, that's probably the easiest way to do that. Um, you know, perhaps there's, you know, there could be a situation. I guess the, the issue that I have is really just about queue length and capacity. And I think, you know, in some cases with a, maybe not that small, those look pretty small, but, um, you know, a smallish site with a good design, you could potentially um, ha handle some of that on site versus, you know, the larger sites, which just by the nature of the limited access onto Haggis Parkway and the size of your development inherently, what you're going to be driving through is going to be a little bit further off the road. And so there would be a, be a little bit more, um, room for queuing if it got to that. I just, the thing about drive-throughs I feel like is if you have something that's so successful, which is really what all we should all be hoping for, right? Um, you, there's no, you can't shut it off. <laughs> so you can only hope that people will choose not to wait in that drive-through lane and block off, you know, a major road. Um, and so you're, again, you're leaving that judgment up to someone else versus having a good design that might accommodate um, additional demand if and when it, it reaches that point. So yeah, I think I think lot size makes some sense um, as sort of a demarcation for that. Thanks, Jennifer. Um, let's see, we've heard from Roger. Rachel, did you wanna chip in some thoughts here? Yeah, I, I guess I've uh, got a couple of questions. Uh, first of all, to use a technical term, this whole proposal makes me queasy um because we have seen a tentative uh, design uh, for a restaurant um, that's really set back uh, that's not going to be a pass by um, whereas so much else on on the uh, highest parkway could be a pass is likely to be a pass by Jay uh, if I could ask, uh, the Beacon Apartment 3 approved, as I recall, a couple of years ago or a year or so ago, um, a subdivision that included two lots uh, off of a Gateway, was it Gateway Drive? Or, then you had the, the entrance there, oh, one on either side that were going to be commercial. Now we have the, the Gateway Apartments is um, is there. Those two lots, um, under this current language, would they be eligible for drive-throughs? Under this current language, yes. And I think that was, again, I think getting back to the question that council was asking is, you know, is there, maybe is that, I think, you know, their concern was sort of seeing the proliferation. And so, but the way, the way their language is currently drafted, yes, every lot in parcel in the Haggis Parkway could potentially have a drive through. So um, they wouldn't need anything connected other than it, it wouldn't have to be a 
an office building connected to a restaurant, they could just have a restaurant with a drive through. So if they can meet the standards, they could put, um, they could put McDonald's there. Well, it'd be have to, it, again, it, they would always have to be part of that, uh, again, as the language is currently written as part of a mixed use building. So it could be a McDonald's attached, you know, as part of a, a multi-tenant building. Well, it, it, couldn't be, it couldn't be a standalone drive through restaurant. It could not. Could not. Right. So they could not the, the, the way the language is written. I believe. How about in the property that we, um, the development that we approved uh, with um, Linwood Higgins down near the, uh, down near the uh, Route 1 end? Again, that's Haggis Parkway zoned. The way this is written, that any drive through would have to be part of a planned development and part of a mixed use building. Okay, so they could put a McDonald's at the building closest to the, uh, connected closest to the, uh, I guess, parkway. If it was part of a mixed use building and went through all the appropriate site plan, yes, yeah. And say, so my, my, my concern is all the ifs. Um, and I, I, I guess a uh, McDonald's, a subway, in other words, some of, well, subway's really not drive-through, but um, some of the typical drive-through restaurants are the, whoops, I'm gonna run in there and uh, just grab a cup of coffee and a donut and take off um, as the traffic study indicates, but there's going to be is Jen was talking about, um, when you get into a mixed use building, there are a lot of restaurants that you cannot tip, a typical restaurants that you cannot put in there. In other words, I don't think a McDonald's would fit. Uh, I don't think a McDonald's would go in, uh, Subway won't go in. I'm just thinking in terms of the various um, restaurants that, that have drive throughs. Um, so it's likely that what would go in there very well could be a destination restaurant as Holy Donuts is um, and attract a lot more traffic. People go to desti destination restaurants. If they don't get McDonald's this one, they'll get a McDonald's at the next one. So I, I think we need a lot more language um, rather than just drive through restaurants are okay or drive through restaurants as part of a larger building are okay. I, I'm, I'm uncomfortable with a sort of blanket. It's okay as long as it meets some extremely minimum requirements and putting the restaurants, I just simply saying a drive through in a, in a building that has at least one other tenant um, is okay. I'm, I'm uncomfortable with that. Thanks, Rachel. Uh, Rick Dupere, did you have any thoughts on this? We'll come back to Rick. Um, oh, sorry, so about worth, that was um, Oh, <laughs> hopefully you didn't, uh, you didn't get it too deep into your spiel. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, you know, I have mixed feelings on this, but I think, I think Rachel and uh, Jen did a pretty good job of saying everything I would say. So, um, you know, I think we have to think about it. All right. That I, I, I said I, I would say that I agree with everything that Jen said. So thanks, Rick. All right, so um, I'll take a swing at this. Uh, I, I'll I'll throw this out there. So when when we look at this, you know, and the reason I kind of went back to the historical question is, is at some point in time we had a vision for Highgate Parkway. We wanted it to be this. We thought it would be great to do it this way, and there's this part of me that says times change, we can adapt. Um, and there are, you know, projects that we weren't thinking of years ago that are great additions to this community that could fit in here 
worker really well. When I phrase it like that, do I ask myself whether we want to see the, the Highgates Parkway dotted with uh, fast, you know, fast food drive drive through restaurants? And not every restaurant out there is a fast food drive through. Uh, there are plenty of establishments that you can get a a, a drive through service uh, at. Um, however, with the language that I see presented here, I, I could see a situation where people were putting in small offices attached to the outdoor and calling it a mixed use building. Um, and, and that's what concerns me. And not only that, there's, there's no limitation. So as much as I hate contract zoning, um, I, I also wonder if that's not a more appropriate process for the highest big project like this. Uh, we just went through this with a car dealership out there, uh, which aren't allowed on highest Parkway, but we had a chance to review it, uh, the council and, and the planning board and said, yeah, this is a use that works okay in here. And, uh, you know, a, a small a small locally owned restaurant that wants to have a window for people to drive through in the mornings or for lunch, I don't think is a detriment to the area. There's plenty of residential, there's plenty of opportunities, but I, I think what we're all trying to, you know, we're all beating around the bush here is we don't see Burger King, KFC, Taco Bell, McDonald's lined up and down Haggis Parkway. And I'll call it for what it is. I think that's what we don't want to see have happen. Um, it, that's the sense I get. And if I'm wrong, somebody can call me out on it. Um, and and so how do you creatively go about allowing maybe a, a local uh, business owner to, uh, you know, maybe seize upon an opportunity, especially in, you know, COVID COVID times to have a, a spot like this. So I'm not, you know, I'm not sure if the answer is lot lot size. Um, I believe separation may give you a better shot at it if you were to draft language or restrictions. Um, but again, I hate to I hate to think that we're going to sacrifice a vision for the area this this area of town for um, something that's here and ready. You know, is it? Is it in the end of the day you want it to be? So those are my, my two cents. And I don't I don't necessarily propose I have the answer to this, but I think it needs more consideration, certainly. Roger? Yeah, um, after listening to my colleagues, I just wanted to, I was trying to think of what kind of a restaurant would be going into a place like this. Um, and I agree with you, Nick, with the, the ones we typically think about, but I also, uh, I'm thinking of, about something like a Panera. Uh, I've seen standalone Paneras that have a drive-through, but they're primarily people actually go into them. You know, um, it's, so maybe if, if, if somehow a, a ratio can be created at, you know, like 75% of the restaurant is, is sit down inside the restaurant versus 25% drive-through or something like that. <clears throat> and um, the, the other comment I would, just want to add, and I, I didn't say say this originally because I didn't know whether it would be appropriate at this level, but I think if you're doing a multi-building, um, multi-use building, for instance, Dunkin' Donuts on Route 1, which has a high glass place next door, see, that's, that's, that's a problem, I think, but I think a bigger problem is Starbucks and the bank and the way those two buildings are configured because sometimes you can't even get into the bank because the queuing to Starbucks wraps all the way around the bank. So it's very critical as to, you know, if you're gonna do a multi-use multi, multi um, use building to really determine where the most traffic's gonna be, what part of that building is gonna have most of the traffic. So I think it can be, I don't know, maybe we should ask the developer, what, did you have a, a restaurant, a certain type of restaurant in mind? Yeah, may I speak? Sure. <laughs> uh, just a little history. We, we bought this property uh, after Michael Scarks passed away, um, the golf and ski, it came with the golf and ski uh, shop retail facility. And we've been trying to figure out what to do with it. And, um, what, what we sort of, been, what we're hoping for is a bank and a coffee shop. And you'll notice in the layout that the, the long drive, I, I try to, I stopped going to Starbucks on Route 1 because you just can't get in there. 
and it's crazy. And, and I, I own one over in Mill Creek in uh, South Portland, and it's created a similar issue, although we made sure we had 16 uh, stacking spaces. Here, um, if we were to get Starbucks, uh, it would be on the end uh, closest to Hagus Parkway. So the, the cars would stack up all the way around the building to that drive through That canopy that you see in the, on the uh, inside part of the building is conceptually a bank canopy with ATM and a drive up window. We don't have any tenants at this point in time. Um, th those are two that we would love to have. We are talking with banks and trying to find one that would like to open up here. We've had extensions discussions with Ben Devine, who's the develop, developer of the Beacon, who actually I think has written a letter in support of this project because there are there are very little services here for his 300 plus residents. And I think the same thing is happening with all the residential development over in the, uh, the former racetrack property. Um, th there is gonna be a demand for more services here. So um, I think, and originally we thought this would be a contract zone. We saw what happened with the, with the uh, uh, auto dealership. Um, but in, in discussions with Jay and, and the, the planning department, uh, they nobody likes contract zones, <laughs> understandably. Um, so uh, they've actually crafted this language in hopes that it would meet the concerns everyone has everyone, including me, I'm a resident of Scarborough, that we don't want to see McDonald's, Burger King, and all these up, up and down Haggis Parkway. I was in the development business 30 years ago, when, or whenever it was when the Haggis concept was originally envisioned, and it was to be corporate headquarters, uh, perhaps large manufacturing facilities, etc. and it just didn't happen. So I think it's in the interest of the town to create uh, taxable property values here. And I think this is one way to uh, achieve that without destroying what or, or creating what nobody wants to see there. So um, we, we have no objection to, to crafting the language a little tighter, but I wanted to give you some idea uh, of what we think we might have in mind. It's conceivable that this could be redesigned when we finally get uh, to discussions with tenants and coming before you with a site plan review to be a, a office, two-story office building. If it was a bank that wanted to have a headquarters there, um, that was one discussion that we had, didn't work out, but um, so it could be more office than, and, and a bank or could be a, uh, a Java Joe's or Starbucks, uh, not Dunkin' Donuts that wouldn't, that wouldn't go work in there, I think. Um, but anyway, that's sort of what we have in mind, if that helps at all. Um, and I think we do obviously have to come back for a complete site plan review. And at that time, we'll have a better idea of where it's going. But in, in order for us to move forward, we need to have some idea of what we, we're gonna be able to do. Thank you. Um, Roger, were you all set on that or do you have anything else to follow up on? Uh, no, I guess I'm all set. Um, it's a tough one. Right. <laughs> so, uh, Jay time. and regarding Jay and Jamel, is this clear as mud for you to take back to the council? Is that is that where we're at at this point? Yeah. So, as part of this process, the board typically provides an advisory opinion, um, and so I think there's certainly been some of the some of the clear items I've heard are around, I think, shared concern with council about the potential proliferation, um, that the language as written may not be quite tight enough to put controls around that potential proliferation, some concern around being sure that the sites that um, would potentially come forward are at least of a size that you know would put some level of controls in place, um, particularly around the issue of site access and queuing lengths and really concerns about uh, what I was hearing anyway, uh, queuing into the into the main arterial. Um, I think 
as is experienced along Route 1 upon occasion in one of the examples that was talked about tonight. Um, we see them from time to time. Those were sort of the main elements I heard concerns around and looking for what I, what I thought I was hearing was uh, the, the desire to see additional language crafted around those issues. Um, so if, if I'm restating your thoughts, then I think that could be sort of <laughs> put forward as, as, it, as an opinion to the council if the board uh, was so comfortable with that. However, I see Rachel has her hand up and- Yeah, of course I do. Um, I, I just kind of want to piggyback a bit on uh, the direction Roger was going in um, and take a look at, um, I, I, I'm trying to think of how best to say this, something that says that the drive-through is an ancillary <coughs> part of the restaurant or an ancillary part of the restaurant. That basically it's a sit-down restaurant that has, as part of it, a, a drive-through. In other words, that's not the main purpose. The drive-through is not the main purpose. Um, that there is a physical restaurant that people will go and sit down at. Um, but there is also an option for the drive-in, for the drive-through. I don't know if that's the direction that, um, Roger, was that kind of what you were going at in terms of the square footage or the percentage of the building? Uh, I, was, I was trying to think of restaurants that have drive-throughs that are not like, you know, uh, McDonald's or Burger King's, and the one that popped to my mind was like a Panera's. Well, uh, that's a, when I said, you know, that the, the basic the basic business is sit through and it has a drive in as an, an amenity, an additional, uh, an additional feature, um, as opposed to something where the drive through is, uh, you know, 90% of the business. Um, Rachel, if I could just clarify real quick, is it, Rachel, can I just ask real quick? So you're, you're more or less worried about the type of type, not necessarily the quantity. Well, I, I, I'm thinking, yeah, I guess I, I, I guess I am that that um, as uh, harking back to the discussion around COVID and the change in the way business is being done, um, it's likely that more traditional restaurants would want an option to provide a takeout service. Uh, and I say that because David's 388 in South Portland now provides a takeout. Um, as opposed to as opposed to it sit down, and there are more restaurants than the what we typically think of as a fast food restaurant uh, that are now looking at ways to keep their businesses going, expand their business, find a slightly new business model, um, and thinking about the drive-in portion of it and as ancillary to the main purpose of of the restaurant. Uh, that certainly assuages some of my concerns about a proliferation of just drive-throughs. And I don't know if that's possible to put into words, but that's, um, uh, to put into I, code, but that's I kind of think of it, Rachel, like any place right now that's offering curbside service, if your building was designed or your parking lot was designed to facilitate it, that could in theory be a drive-through service, right? You call ahead, place an order, drive through and pick it up. So that that's the part that I, you know, just checking this off as fast food and, um, you know, sort of what we all five years ago or I don't know, one year ago thought of as a drive-through restaurant. I think that model to your point um could be changing and that to you know to try and think i've had a hard time listening to this conversation too and thinking like well what would that be who what kind of restaurant would that be what could i picture here what could i picture in other places along the parkway that i think would be good fits or that i think would be problematic um in keeping with the character of the the zone in the parkway itself um but then I just remembered, you know, like curbside. Hey, I have two little kids that sleep in the back of the car. Are you kidding me? Any place that I can drive through and do something, it's like on my radar. <laughs> so, um, you know, it's a 
it's a it's very car centric so that's you know probably worth worth thinking about i think for a, a site like this and this probably gets a little bit towards the site design but if if we're hearing support for this um the site development coming from its neighbors to the other side i think it would be terrific to have some sort of connection off of um or, uh between the two properties without requiring someone to drive out onto Haggis Parkway for that. Um, but, but yeah, you know, I think um, it does, it may not always need to be kind of the, what we have always thought of as drive through. And I think, um, you know, certainly talking about it in terms of the drive through itself being ancillary is one way, um, one way to quantify it. Um, yeah, I think that's a good, it's a good suggestion. No, uh, May I speak no. to that for just a moment? Sure. <laughs> just, just two points. One, nobody's opening up uh, restaurants for indoor seating today. Um, it's just not happening. All the examples you've mentioned uh, are people trying to survive in their business by creating alternatives to coming inside to eat. None of us, at least in my family, want to go into a restaurant to sit down and eat now. Secondly, to uh, Ms. Ladd's comment, we are connected internally with the beacon. The road system comes up uh, through, and that's one of the things that was exciting to Ben, that these people could come out, drive up, go through, grab their coffee or whatever, and, and go. So um, I just want to make those two points. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, so I think we've provided some decent input. I'd really like to see how this all gets to the next round of discussion. Uh, that's a lot of language work, I think, Jay, and a lot of tightrope walking that you'll probably have to do to try to get <laughs> buy-in from not only the members of this board, but I know the members of the council. So I think we, we're gonna let you try to do that a while. Um, I know you've had good feedback, I think, from everyone here. Um, no one hates drive throughs I mean, look, I'm, I'm in the same boat as Jen. I've got, I've got plenty of kids, and uh, it's a lifesaver some days. Uh, so, <laughs> um, but I, I think, I think that you can get a sense for the general consensus here is that you don't want to see Haggis Parkway line with them. So, um, good luck with that type rope act. I uh, appreciate all of the efforts here, Mr. Sturgeon. Yeah, I just want to so see your direction is for us to work with Jay which we'll do, we'll do that and go from there. I did want to thank everybody for your, for your time. I know it took a lot longer than you probably thought. Um, I was a planning board member for the city of Bangor for six years. So I know donating this amount of time is, is worth a lot. Thank you again. Yeah. Um, thank you. I appreciate it. And Nick, uh, Nick, just, Nick, I just want to clarify real quick for Jay. Um, Jay, I, from the discussion here, I would say the recommendation is that the language is not ready to proceed as presented to us. Yeah, That's if you needed I, a clear black and white. It, I guess that was going to be my question. What, what, what I thought I heard you saying was, you know, that it could use some additional conversation by, by this board. And I mean, I guess that's a question. Does the board want this to come back to you? Cause as, sort of the typical process, once you give your advisory opinion, it goes to council and then it's in their wheelhouse. Um, I would say if the planning board feels you want more discussion around this, and certainly the council, I think, expressed an interest in having the board have a, a robust discussion around this, then um, you know certainly we could work on something and continue the public hearing. Um, I wonder, and just for my, you know, I wonder if it's not, not better to see this go back to long range planning for some of this. Um, Cause I'm not sure you want to see the council hash this out in minor details either, but I guess that would be under their purview, whether to kick it back to long range planning. Mm -hmm. uh, I just, from what I've seen and from what I've heard here, I'm just not hundred percent sure the language that's being presented seems to have the support of this board at this time. And it didn't sound like the council had full support of the language that was being presented either. So, Where's your, where do you start again, um, is the question. But Roger, it, I know you've been dying to get something in there. Oh, What's going on? Uh, I, was just gonna, I was just gonna say, in addition, the Long Range Planning Committee, they basically were in favor of something like this. Isn't that correct? 
Um, yeah, I think they, I mean, I, like I said, I think they had some concerns around traffic as well. Um, but um, I think generally there was a generally favorable opinion of the matter, but certainly if there's certain issues that have been raised here and at the council level, that, that would certainly be part of, I think what I'm hearing Nick say is maybe the advisory opinion to council is that this, that this have additional time at the long range planning committee who by charter is the committee that works on and provides recommendations on land use um, elements. So um, if that's, you know, that's certainly a, a viable option for this board to have as your opinion to the council as this sort of marches forward. I think what would be helpful too is the long range planning committee saw this first with zero input from either the council or planning board, right? So they were kind of just, you know, they, they saw it, they chewed on it and they said, okay, let's see where this goes. I think that they're probably gonna have from both of those uh, bodies will help them maybe identify and kind of um, what I think is gonna happen, maybe a more restrictive language or um, being being put. So at least they have a little bit more guidance next time they, they decide to tackle this. Jen? Can I just can I just add something to that? Um, to to be a little more specific, I think the um, it's interesting that um, you know what I'm hearing in this discussion is that we are sort of uh, we don't want a parkway aligned with the traditional um, land use code. I'm thinking of for fast food restaurant uses. However, from a traffic standpoint, which is what the long range planning committee was concerned with, that's actually the better case that if you had a drive through that was part of a uh, ancillary to an, a different restaurant, a sit down restaurant use, um, that is going to have a higher impact in terms of uh, trip generation at least and um, while we've been having this conversation, I remembered that this, you know, this zone is essentially bookended by two currently fairly busy intersections. And so what that means um, from a traffic standpoint is your traffic is either coming from the left or coming from the right, generally speaking. Um, and also earlier on this agenda, you know, we, we had discussions about or continued discussions about the traffic demand that the Downs project will bring to this area, um, applying to each of those two intersections. So I think, um, you know, I share the Long Range Planning Committee's concern about traffic. And so I just wonder if, um, you know, there might be, maybe there's a land use, um, you know, I know land use codes, at least in terms of trip generation, do, there are different applications for different types of restaurants. So I wonder if maybe looking at that as a way to try and um, filter what, it, you know, filter and tailor what it is that we're looking for here might, it might be helpful. Thanks, Sarah. Jay, you uh, think you got this one? Um, I, what I'm gleaning from the conversation is that the <laughs> advisory opinion to council is that there be further consideration uh, by long range planning committee of the comments uh, talked about tonight by the planning board, as well as the concerns previously expressed by council and of course any others that council may otherwise express. But that what the language as presented tonight is not quite ready um, for a prime time, so to speak. I think that's probably the best you're gonna do with it. I mean, you're asking, uh, you're asking for, uh, you know, very, very smart, intelligent people here that, uh, to agree on one exact plan forward. And I don't know if that's always gonna be the way. So 
let's configure committee. So they find the bigger the uh, way forward. <laughs> Mr. Sturgeon. <coughs> Mr. Sturgeon. Yeah, one, one last thing. Like, um, we might have to look at contract zone change because I don't I don't know if we're ever going to agree on the whole the whole Pegas Parkway and, and finding verbiage that's going to to meet the, the desire of the long range planning, the council, the planning board. I just think it's almost an impossible task. So you know, I guess I'm going to have to rethink and talk to the clients and maybe reach out to you, Jay, in the next few days and say, should we, uh, you know, pick up the marbles and, and start again? I just, I just think it's, it might be too tough a mountain to climb um, for the whole Vegas Parkway. Thanks for that. Regarding the contract zone, the only problem you'll, I, I tend to agree with you on that. Um, the only problem you might have with that is part of the criteria of the contract zone is the, the town has to see a benefit, you know, and that's where I'm not sure the council will buy the idea that a drive through Starbucks is a benefit. You know, just keep that in mind. So, all right. I think um, I think we've spent enough time on this issue. I've got to push it forward to the next item on the agenda. But I want to thank the applicants for their time and their insights on this. Efforts and an important thank problem. You. Thank, thank you. you. And Nick, just just to confirm that the board's advisory opinion is as I sort of had restated. Is that I just want it to is. be sure that that's clear for the record that it's not my opinion, but I it's think the you got board's that look of it. Correct. What's that? I think you're okay. correct. You got Thank the you. Okay. Right. Next item on tonight's agenda, number 13, the planning board will conduct a public hearing to receive comment on the proposed to map relating to rezoning at 103 Muzzy Road from General Business B3 Zoning District to the Industrial I Zoning District. This is a piece that we are to provide um, advice to the uh, uh, town council on. So with that, uh, uh, Jay or Jamel? Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll kick this one off. Um, this is another property owner initiated zoning amendment request. This one, however, is a little different than what we just saw. What we just saw, as you uh, will remember, was about a language change to existing zone. This is a zoning uh, map amendment to amend uh, the zoning of 103 Muzzy Road from B3 zoning, which is, uh, you know, one of our uh, uh, commercial um, zones to an industrial zone, um, the industrial zone. Um, and so that is the request. It's, as I said, this is a map amendment request, not anything to do with the actual zoning language. Um, so with that, I know the applicants here, they can speak to their proposal from there. <clears throat> Uh, Mr. Bushy. Yes, sir. Thank you, uh, Chairman and the board. Jay's gone over it uh, quickly enough here, I think. <coughs> a four-acre uh, parcel on Muzzy Road owned by Transport Leasing, a uh, property owner in the community for a number of years now. Uh, they are seeking to basically change back of the zoning from B3 to industrial. I'll note that in, I believe, around 2009 or so, the land had been in the industrial zone and was rezoned at that time to B3. And uh, the owners had uh, made light of that to the planning uh, folks at the time, that's uh, previous planners. And uh, there had been some, I guess, verbal commitment that if in the event that transport leasing uh, really wanted to get a more industrial use in there that they could simply go through the process as we are now uh, to restore the industrial zone to the property. They are in fact uh, at a point where they're seeking to build a, a new building roughly 14,000 square feet uh, into a warehouse or recycling uh, facility and both of those uses really fall uh, better under the permitted uses within the industrial zone as opposed to the B3. So uh, industrial activity and industrial uses are more in the wheelhouse of this particular landowner as well. Uh, I'll note transport leasing owns property on Pleasant Hill Road, 
as well as in uh, other communities here in Southern Maine. And uh, their prime business model really does fall in the industrial category uh, and lesser so the commercial B3 retail type uh, businesses. That's not really their, their uh, bread and butter in terms of business operations. So that's why they're looking to get this back into that industrial zone. We think it's relatively straightforward. The maps clearly show that uh, there is an industrial zone uh, that continues to the east of the site uh, along Muzzy Road. And uh, I believe the residential behind has always been that case. So they're basically just looking to get their, their property back into that industrial piece. And uh, with that, I'll turn it back to the planning board. Thank you very much. We do have the opportunity for public comment on this. If there's anyone here that would like to speak, please use the raise my hand feature, in the lower right hand corner of your Zoom app. With that, I'll close public comment. I do not, um, I'm just gonna throw this out to the board in general. Does anyone have any questions or uh, comments on this? Again, this is an advice to the council as to whether we think this is a good idea. You know, um, this is Rick Jennifer? and uh, I'm- hey, Rick, Rick, why don't we so let you go? VR2, yeah. Sorry, what's that? The VR2 zone that appears to be the, to the south of that industrial zone, um, is that is that developed? I guess I, I'm not familiar with what's in that VR2 zone now, where it's a where it's a vill village residential. Are there houses and residences and single-family homes right there? Does anybody know? Uh, this is Jay Rick. Um, I don't have the aerial before me, but that property. Um, there may be one single family home or, or maybe two down sort of a longer private road slash really more of a driveway actually than a private road. I think there's one house back there. Um, I think before it was VR2 zoned, I believe it was maybe R4, R2 zoned if I remember right. It's been a number of years since we rezoned that area. Um, but um, there, there isn't, to your question, there isn't a, a, an established neighborhood, but certainly there is a property owner um, and a residence. And potentially it could be, I mean, I, I don't think there's sewer in that area quite yet, right? So those are, I guess what I'm getting at are these are an industrial area there now, and we're just kind of, expanding it a little bit to what appears to be the west um of the east i'm uh, the west but um i guess if the um is they're gonna be doing recycling there you said um that's what the intent is to recycle on that lot. So is there a water, I guess, Mr. Robin was here in a way. Is there a watershed in that area? I guess where it's industrial, we'll just make the industrial bigger to accommodate this um, facility. I, I guess I don't really have an issue with it other than um, as long as it doesn't adversely affect the neighbors and I guess um, without an aerial, I can't really tell what's there. So um, I'm not sure if any other board members are more familiar with that particular area than I am. But if it, if it doesn't adversely affect the neighbors or the watershed, I guess it's fine. But I, I guess I don't have any data that says it doesn't adversely affect the neighbors and the, and the watershed because we don't even have a we don't have any information as to what's going. If, if you if you already know what's going there, there must be some building plans or something. I just I don't know. I just I don't feel like I have enough information to myself to change that zoning. <coughs> I mean that's all. Unless I would like, if I was going to send a recommendation to the board, I'd want or to the town council, I'd want more information as to what the intent is other than just saying we're just going to put a recycling there i think i think rick once you change the zone um that use can 
can all of a sudden accommodate anything allowed in the industrial. Mr. Chair, I, I will add our package does include a, a site plan uh, that shows the uh, layout of a, the new building. I think, Chair, uh, if I, I can add, maybe maybe clarify a couple of things that um, Rick just asked to us pulling up. Um, does appear to have sewer and water in that area. Yes. And I believe it is um, within the none such watershed. I know across the street is Red Brook, which is obviously um, in that area too. Um, but I don't believe this site drains that way. Maybe Steve could clarify that. You're correct, Angela. It would okay. be the none such uh, watershed being on the south side of, of Muzzy Road. So I guess we'll go back if, to the board. If we just change the zoning, um, yeah, we would, at some point we would again, revisit what's gonna go there. So I guess I feel a little bit, I'm, I'm, I guess I feel a little bit more comfortable with that. I just, and if the, if the neighbors, I, I just sometimes fear that the neighbors aren't aware of what we're doing on the board and, um, and if we do something that that significantly impacts the neighborhood, I just am a little bit hesitant to proceed too fast, but I'd like to hear how the rest of the board feels. Thanks, Rick. Jen, I saw your hand up. Yeah, I just had a question. Um, if anybody knows, so it sounds like this was zoned industrial to a certain point, the applicant's letter says 2009, and then it was zoned over, the zone was changed over to the B3. But I was curious if anyone knows, um, prior to 2009, were those other, so I'm looking at, I'm looking at this graphic, um, the other properties that are currently B3, were those always B3 or were those also industrial? So I'm just curious, like, was this in the middle of an otherwise industrial stretch and then we, we, we changed them all to B3 and drew the line on the Nielsen Road side of this property? Or was... Um, is it just this one property that seems to have changed back and forth? Does that make sense? Yeah, in the 2009 changes, there are sort of a host of changes in the eight corners area. So it wasn't just this, it wasn't just a singular property question at the time. Okay. And I ask because it sounds like, it sounds like this parcel has, well, it was industrial. It sounds like it's been used as industrial prior to 2009, perhaps, and then maybe since 2009, and now they just want to um, continue to use it that way and change the zoning accordingly. Um, I, my question is just rooted in, you know, what the context of the rest of the area was and what the intent is um, moving forward. I don't um given that it abuts a very large otherwise industrially zoned area i don't really um there's there's not a lot of concern that jumps out at me but i was just curious about the history on on um, the zoning and the usage there so thanks and nick if you don't mind before you jump to the next board member i, I did just want to i think touching back on a question of I, sorry i believe it was roger um, I just had opportunity to touch base with Doreen, who does, uh, as you all know, all our administrative and keeps uh, Jamel, Angela, and I straight. Uh, there was a butter notification on this item. So, Roger, I know, I think it was you who raised, you know, concerns or mm -hmm. questions about, um, you know, a butters being aware of what's happening, and they were at least provided that um, piece of notification for what it's worth. Roger. Yeah, 
Um, it was Rick, um, Jay, that mentioned your butter. But um, <clears throat> I, I, I believe this was all industrial, this area. And it got changed when, um, when the v, VR2 was developed. I may be mistaken there, but I think that's what happened. And there's a couple of small businesses right on Muzzy Road, small, you know, single buildings that have been there as long as I can recall. And whether that was B3 or some other, you know, it might have been industrial end or right up to Muzzy Road, for all I know as well. Um, so I, does, would that make sense, Jay, that when, once that v, VR2 was established, that that's when the zoning got changed and they tried to use uh, Nielsen Road as a, as so, sort of like a boundary? Um, well, as, as, as I previously said, it, it, I believe it all occurred when there was sort of a series of rezoning in the eight corners area. So I, I don't have um, the binder with me that has all the information um, that I can, you know, tell you exactly what parcels it all occurred with. Um, but I guess, you know, just in, it, it wasn't, as I said before, I know it wasn't a singular lot change back in 2009. What all it exactly entailed, I can't tell you from uh, memory at this moment. I, um, I happen to have an occasion one time, a number of years ago, to go down to that house it's like a it's a very nice farmhouse that's on the end of Nielsen um, the woman used to work for the school department I believe and um, I believe their family owns do you know do you know who I'm talking about Jay okay and I believe they own quite a bit of land all around there I I, I don't I, I don't have a problem with this, but I mean, they've had trailers and things like that on that piece of property for a long time. All right, thank you, Roger. Uh, Rachel? Yeah, um, I'm I'm fine now that I've heard that the, the abutters were, were notified. Um, just as a, a lesson to the town, um, I note on the Margaret Smith letter uh, that the former town planner, and I'm quoting, assured the applicant that the town would approve a rezoning of the property back to its original industrial zone when applicant was ready to develop the property. That, um, my opinion, shouldn't have been said. Uh, and because the approval has to come through uh, the town council with the um, input of various town committees. So that's just sort of a, a lesson. At the same time, um, while I don't think that statement has any uh, binding effect on the town, uh, it's something that the property owner relied on. And um, that puts us in the, in the position of saying, you know, the, the, this property owner believed that that was an option that would be approved without apparently any problem. And um, I don't think, uh, I just don't think it behooves us to, to say no, um, because that person relied upon the communication from the town. So I'm not particularly happy with the uh, former planner as it was as it was said there, but I, I am okay uh, as long as the abutters were, were notified and apparently have not had any sort of response. I, I understand that one member of the long range planning was uh, concerned about sort of industrial creep, but um, I think the creep is small enough that uh, that it's, it's okay to rezone. Thanks, Rachel. All right. Uh, Rick, Mind King, I neglected you all night. Do you have anything to add to this? <laughs> no, I don't. I don't mind. I'm, I'm also doing a lot of learning here. Um, I guess 
the one question I have, what, what constitutes industrial versus commercial? Um, it, it appears that the projected or the proposed building going there, is it really a deemed industrial use or is it just another commercial use? And, you know, this could be a mute point if, if what's going in there is, you know, uh, general business or commercial, uh, why would we have this discussion? I guess that's my, my question. I, I, I guess I'm not sure the difference between the commercial aspect of this and an industrial use of this uh, lot. Yeah, and I think if, if I can, um, Nick, if you don't mind, you know. I was expecting that, yeah. <laughs> there's the, the difference in permitted uses. I mean, essentially, um, as I noted, the B3 is really more of a uh, retail um, service oriented uh, zoning ordinance where the industrial district is really just that. It's much more, you know, more uh, oriented towards uh, warehousing, manufacturing, and those sorts of uses. Um, so I guess I would want to then ask, um, and I'm sure the applicant has thought about the type of uses they want, or they probably wouldn't have come forward with the proposed zoning change, but I guess that might be the next question would be then to Mr. Bushy, um, just to assure that that due consideration was given before they came forward with their proposal. Thank you, Jay. And Mr. Chairman, I'll add the three categories of use that fall specifically uh, within the industrial, and that's warehousing, uh, mini warehouse slash storage, and recycling facility. And it's those three that are, are specific to the industrial and not the B3 that uh, for us, uh, mark the, the important land uses that we want to have uh, available to uh, this building. Oh, thanks, Mr. Bushy. That, that's very, very helpful. So then I guess we are in an industrial zone if you're looking at recycling. Um, and, and so at this point, I guess I don't have a real issue with, with uh, renaming this area as an industrial uh, lot versus uh, general business. Uh, now that the abutters are informed and uh, uh, see what it takes from there. So from my standpoint, I guess this would be a permitted use if we change the, uh, the recycling would be a permitted use if we changed it to industrial. And I don't see why uh, we would not want to uh, have a development a building here, I mean, it'd look a whole lot better than just a graveyard for tractor trailers. That's all I have. Thanks, Rick. I appreciate it. All right. Any other planning board comments on this? And Nick, sorry, if I could just jump in one last time. Sure. Um, so based on the fact that it was industrial and it abuts an industrial um, zone, I don't necessarily have, you know, I would not be in favor of it, I guess I would say, but my, I guess I would like to, my concern I'd like to express is that I think that we're only supposed to be changing zoning if there's some benefit to the town. And the reason I say that is when you, when you buy a piece of property, when anybody buys a piece of property in Scarborough, they look at the zoning and they look at the zoning around them and they buy that piece of property based on, for example, if you were to buy a house in a residential district, you would not expect or want the zoning to change next to your house to something other than residential if it was surrounded by residential initially. So again, for this particular instance where it was industrial and there's an industrial zone next to it, um, I'd be okay with this one, but I, I would, you know, in the future, if I, if we see this again, I think when, when people buy a piece of property with a particular zoning and a particular zoning around them, 
they expect that to stay the same unless there's a benefit to the town. Um, and by the town, I mean the people that live in the town. So, all right, that's all my preaching I have to do tonight. But I'm okay with this one. Thanks, Rick. So, Jay, um, based on the comments received here, um, and colleagues, stop me if I'm incorrect, I would think that the appropriate recommendation to the council for, for us would be that the zoning on this is, the zoning change on this is okay. My colleagues can Yes. Okay. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Thank Mr. you. Buck. All right. Um, so we have, uh, it's 10.05. Um, for anyone that's been waiting uh, this evening, um, I, you know, we want to say, uh, one, you know, the rule is we don't take up new business after 10 o'clock, but two, uh, the board has been very conscious uh, that these agendas are getting longer and we have people that really need answers and are pressed for time and efforts and, and money and we understand it and we're here. Uh, with that said, we actually have a second, um, a continuation of this meeting will be taking place next Monday night. Uh, this is a departure from our every three week schedule to help clear out some of this um, uh, work that's been coming at us. Um, and I appreciate my, my colleagues, um, you know, uh, willingness to step up and do this. It's for everyone out there. We are fully volunteer board. Uh, we have ex excellent support staff, uh, which is the only reason this is bearable as a volunteer. Uh, so with that said, uh, the rest of the items 14 through Through 21 have been tabled until Monday evening. Uh, start time is 6.30 p.m. Um, right back at the Zoom. Uh, with that, I will uh, move into a staff report. Uh, Jamel. Start if you guys want. Okay. So I'll just report on some of the pre-construction meetings we've had over the past few weeks. Um, we, were, we held a pre-construction meeting for the cottages at Sawyer subdivision along Sawyer Road, um, the Merrill Brook Bridge Crossing off Merrill Brook Drive, and the Frederick Bros Project um, <laughs> off Rigby Road. We also had a pre-construction meeting for the Mint Salon Block on Technology Way. And we had an off-site pre-construction meeting uh, for just off-site work within Gorham Road for the Holbrook Farms uh, subdivision a few days ago. That's all I have for now. Can I jump um, on to sure. that? Yeah, I just wanted to piggyback on that because I was going to bring up um, Holbrook Farm um, in the work in Gorham Road because I know Roger reached out to me um, today. So I wanted to acknowledge that um, that work happening in Gorham Road was associated with that subdivision and the connection of the sewer to um, that subdivision. And it was not any work being done by the town. So um, at this point, uh, we don't have anything scheduled um, for construction for the town. Um, we do have plans um, that were being finalized for phase two of Gorham Road, but at this point, there is no funding set aside um, to continue that work, but we're hopeful in future years that may happen. Thanks, Angel. Jay? Yep, just uh, I want to thank the board for attending a couple of recent workshops and just give you a heads up as to what what's occurring since those. So on the administrative review piece, as I mentioned, um, that was something that council leadership and town manager had asked we start to work on. Um, based on the conversation we had, um, there is language being drafted and that will be should be prepared in the next week or two. And so certainly that will be part of an ongoing conversation that we have to, to see where, where that leads us uh, in the end. So just want to let you know that that is progressing. And then also on the comprehensive plan, um, we met with the long range planning committee following the workshop. Um, and we're putting together the final details right now for um, the following public forums uh, to really engage the, the public at large. 
Um, and so at our meeting next Monday, um, I'll, I'll be, I, I should have those dates uh, formalized and, and, and the like, but just want to let you know that those continue to progress and um, thank you for your time coming to those uh, workshops. We know we've been asking a lot of you and you've also put yourselves out there to sort of do the continued meeting or whatever we want to call it next, next Monday. Um, and I'm sure the applicants that didn't get heard tonight are appreciative of that. So. Thanks, Jay. <clears throat> Administrative amendment report. Just one to report on. Uh, the folks at the Next Gen Fitness Center along Pleasant Hill Road, uh, they got approval for administrative approval for a uh, turf strip at the rear of their building. Um, sort of a continuation of what you guys approved a year or two ago. That's all I have for this time. Correspondence? None. Planning board comments. All right, a quiet group tonight. Good night, guys. I will make a motion to adjourn. Second. All in favor. Aye. Aye. Thanks, everyone. Everybody Five fifty nine. Hey, Chantara. Chantara. Yes, ma'am. Can you can you see me? I don't know what I just did to my screen. I'm over playing. I, I see. Okay. I see you.